right. Good night, good night, good night, one and all. Good afternoon, good morning to some. As usual, it's good to be back here with you. I have a lot to cover tonight, so I'm going to jump uh, immediately into it. Now, those who, I guess, uh, will see it later, they'll come on later. Eh? <laughs> okay, I'll catch up with it. But as you can see, our topic tonight is spiritual rules of engagement. This is something that I think that uh, a lot of you need to hear because, and again, this particular teaching is based on some uh, <clears throat> frequent emails that I've been getting. And it's just so amazing how people are so quick to become frustrated and quick to to uh, to give up. So this teaching tonight is to show you uh, not so much what you're doing wrong, but what you're not doing. And as with everything in life, whether it's a job or relationship or whatever it may be, there are rules that govern it. And if you you think you can go into this thing arbitrarily and do what you want to do or act upon your feelings, then you already at a loss. <clears throat> in fact, you're working hand in hand with the enemy, don't even realize it. So my job tonight is to, first of all, take you into a story to show you how these protocols are activated so that your spiritual help, your angelic force, and those spiritual things that God has put in place to fight your real enemy, the spiritual enemy, we're just the hands and feet on this earth. The reality is, uh, the reality is, uh, is spirit beings that are fighting for us against other spiritual beings behind our physical enemies. Okay, I know that sounds confusing, but it's going to make a lot, a lot of sense tonight. And I think, and I've said this before, I think in, in every church of God, every house of God, I think after a person would have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, the first thing they ought to be taught is spiritual warfare. Well, I wouldn't say the first thing. The first thing should be what exactly took place during their uh, accepting Jesus Christ and all of that uh, foundational stuff. But the next teaching ought to be spiritual warfare because that's what you signed on to. You have literally signed on to be to fight demons and evil spirits and and things that you cannot see. In fact, if you talk to the average person, when you talk about these things, they, they would conclude very quickly that your head isn't right or you need to go to an asylum. So this is why I feel that most people who accepted Jesus Christ, and I used to be one of them, we have no foundation of what we have signed on to and what we are up against. All we do is we look around and we mimic those whom we see in the church. We see people screaming and shouting and saying hallelujah and going off in tantrums and falling on the ground and people have to cover them up uh, supposedly under the power of God. But this could not be the power of God because these same people get right back up out of this charade and they continue with their broke, miserable, frustrated, impatient life. So what really happened, what they did is they mimic or imitate, it, imitate what they saw other people did. And no one ever taught you what is it, what, what actually took place when you said you made Jesus Christ your personal Savior. Uh, what enemies did you cause to come against you when you did it? Are they physical? Are they spiritual? How is it that ever since I accepted Jesus Christ, I have everybody and their dog and cat coming after me? from a physical perspective. So my job tonight is show you the spiritual components behind that and how you need to know the rules of engagement to be successful every time. Now, let me be clear with being successful every time. There's a saying, and I remember uh, my uh, Bible uh, teacher when I went to Vision International uh, College, I didn't finish it, but I did go there, uh, Dr. Susan J. Wallace. And she used to say all the time, you may, you may lose the battle, but you could still win the war. And of course, she explained that quite well to me because there are many battles that will lead up to the conclusion of the war and you losing battles throughout the war, does it, sorry, losing battles throughout the war do not mean that you're going to lose the entire war. So you have to be strategic. You have to be, and strategic doesn't mean you have to position yourself in a certain posture. No, strategic means 
having the knowledge of what you're fighting and what are, what 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 requirements do you need what attire what what equipment should i have to be successful or even to be qualified for this fight these things are key to learn because when you don't know this you're going to focus more on what you see the enemy is coming with and because the enemy know that you're ignorant to what this war is about this is where he immediately sent out his foot soldiers of fear to really shut you down. Because once you're paralyzed by fear and anxiety and depression and all this other stuff, you know, I'm no strength to fight nobody. <laughs> you end up fighting yourself. Okay, so we need to know the rules. So what I'm going to do tonight, I want us to quickly, we're going to look at two scriptures. I'm going to break these scriptures down, strip them all apart. And when I'm done with that, I'm kind of working backward tonight. Once I'm done with these two particular scriptures and these two stories, then I'm going to take you to uh, some rules of engagement, spiritual warfare rules. But these rules that I'm giving you, because there are, there, are there are thousands of them, but I reduce these rules based on these two stories I'm going to give you. One is going to be in Second Chronicles, and the first one we're going to read tonight is going to be in Matthew 17, all right? In fact, you could turn there right now, Matthew chapter 17, and we're going to read from verse 14 to 21. So once I would have read both of these stories, break these stories down, then I'm going to take you to the rules. So you must have your pen, you must have your paper or whatever recording device, because I'm going to give you quite a bit of scriptures, as usual, so that you, the whole purpose of what I do is to encourage you to say, wow, I like all that stuff, but let me see if Kevin telling us the truth. So now you go and study the scriptures for yourself. You go. I'm just giving you a, a foundation or a clear understanding. And that is something that I preach to you all the time. We are not here to debate. We are not here to row one another. A lot of people in my recent videos started to put stuff in the comment section to create a debate. Immediately, I uh, delete the comment. And I will tell you again, if you attempt it again, I will block you. My channel is not for debate. I'm not here to debate you. I don't debate scripture. I obey scripture. To, I, I say this to you over and over. TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, every time you turn on these social media platform, some clown is coming to tell you God is in real. The word hallelujah means you're serving the devil. If you use the word amen, it comes from Kemet, and it means something satanic. It's like everybody is just taking whatever they pick up somewhere and turning it into a doctrine. And that's why I love the way God has gifted me to teach this word. And that is to saturate you with scripture, break down the scripture, and the whole purpose of what I do is so that you leave, listen carefully, with an understanding I ain't going to debate you. Don't even ask me no questions in the chat because I can't answer you. I'm teaching you, okay? I see people do this all the time. I could be talking with the man on the morning for some way, somehow, they go and squeeze the dream. Oh, what does yellow mean in the dream? I don't know. Yellow probably means it's a color. <laughs> so what I'm saying to you, stay focused because you're not listening to these things by accident. There's some trouble. There's some spiritual warfare up the road that God is equipping you with now with the necessary knowledge because that's what's going to cause you to be victorious in the future. Uh, Proverbs 11, verse 9b, through knowledge shall you, the just, be delivered. Let's be clear. Through knowledge. Remember what I said earlier. I said to you earlier when I first started, I said, listen, when you first accepted Jesus Christ, especially if you were part of a Baptist or Pentecostal church, and you see people go off in the spirit, they drop on the floor, they're in tongues, and a bunch of people got to come around them and circle them like ring play or some foolishness. And this person going off in tongues. Now, let me tell you why that means nothing, right? Listen to me carefully. And I'm not being demeaning. I want you to get an understanding. I'm not here to degrade anybody. I want you to get the understanding. In the scripture, we're about to go into Matthew 17, verse 21, right? About this man and his son having spiritual difficulties and challenges, all right? The disciples in their first attempt, even though they fail, they try to do it their way. Now, however that way was, I don't know. But in this case, I'll assume. Let's say they went off in tongues. Let's just say, all right? Shandala, blah, 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 all this other stuff. Now, maybe I haven't read it as yet, or maybe uh, I'm not aware of it. But 
I don't recall any scriptures that says speaking in tongues gives you power over uh, spiritual opposition. I've never read that. I've never read a scripture. Maybe you can show it to me. I could. I don't know everything, and I always open for correction. If anyone could tell me in any part of the Bible, speaking in tongues, which is a spiritual gift, and for most part, people, well, not people, but the Bible says that one of the evidence of your salvation is speaking in tongues. Is there a scripture that says once a person activate tongue speaking, somehow that's empowering them to overcome evil forces? No. And even, even, even if I didn't believe that, I remember in my days in church, I could remember, I could remember clearly there were elderly women and they would go off speaking in tongues and jumping and literally running around like mad people. And like I would have said to you in several other videos, as a young man, that made no sense to me because at the end of the day, I watched these people still struggle. I watched these people problem after problem and and every time they come to church and tell their story, is always something negative and the devil fighting them in their finances and their marriage, their children stringing on drugs, their daughters getting pregnant for guys and they had to leave school. And so I'm trying to figure out all of this tongue speaking, all of this running around, all of this performance. Why? Because as far as I'm concerned, based on your performance, you are under the power of God. The power of God that raised Christ from the dead, according to you, is upon your life. So my question always was, why is that power limited to your performance at that time? Nobody's life changed. You, you didn't bounce back out of that or that trance or episode and rest your hand on somebody and they would deliver, or, or even rest your hand on yourself and break the spirit of poverty and frustration off your life. None of that happened. So it goes back to what I said earlier. You join these places. You, you, you fall in line to follow these fruitless routines, having no idea of why you're there. What is the spiritual world all about? What is spiritual implication, demons, evil spirits? What is the real foundation and understanding of these things. Because if you don't know the rules of engagement, then all you did when you joined the church and quote unquote got saved is you made a commitment to be another member of the bandwagon now. That, that's all you did. And you would be fruitless just like them. Okay, so let's quickly go here now to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17, and then we're going to leave from Matthew 17, and we're going to go to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, all right? So Matthew 17 is just going to set a small foundation, and then we're going to expand on it more, okay? So Matthew 17, and we're going to go at verse 14, all right? And most of you know this story. I've used this quite a bit. It says, and when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him, and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic, or his head ain't right, like we see in the Bahamas, or his head ain't good, all right? And so vexed, for oftentimes he followed into the fire, and oftentimes he would throw himself into pools of water. So clearly this boy isn't operating on his right faculties. He is challenged, I guess, from a worldly perspective, mentally. But we as believers, again, this is where we are now trained to understand the root problem. We know that he is possessed by evil spirits. Okay, so verse 16 of Matthew 17 says, And I, being the daddy, brought him, which is his son, to the disciples, and they could not cure him. Now remember what I told you in my teaching on, Lord help my unbelief. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, and this is where the story becomes interesting, it says that Jesus called his 12, his 12 disciples, and gave them power over all manner and sickness of disease and casting out devils and so on, evil spirits. So these guys are equipped with spiritual power that in this instance here, they were incapable of removing the spirit from this boy. So right off the bat, you're going to see where not because you have power, spiritual power, whether you're in the kingdom of light or whether you're in the kingdom of darkness, and the people of the kingdom of darkness understand this more, there are protocols that you have to follow, even though you have the power 
to harness this power or to work in harmony for this power to work for you. But not because you say you're saved and you fill with the power of God. You could go there and, and spin spider web and, and do poop, 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 and people get healed and all that. No, there is a there is a protocol or rules of engagement that is mandatory. I didn't want to do this, but I have to do this so I could pound more on my point as to why this man, these, this, these disciples couldn't heal. So let's quickly just go here to Matthew chapter 10. So I want to show you guys who, who haven't heard me talk on this before. So Matthew chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. So listen now. Remember in verse 17, these guys fail to heal this boy. So Matthew 10 verse 1 says, And when he, which is Jesus, had called unto him his 12 disciples. This is now including Judas. And this is beautiful. <laughs> boy, I love scripture here. Because even though Jesus knew that Judas was a demon, he, he still gave him this power. Watch this. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, listen, he gave them power. So this is the evidence now that in the 17th chapter of Matthew, okay, they are equipped with power. He gave them power against what? Unclean spirits, like what that boy had, to cast them out. They have the power to do it and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases. Let me stop right there right now. Everyone listening to me right now, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and committed your life to him, you have the same power. And you need to notice because tradition has taught you, oh, I'm not qualified. I have to let Kevin pray for me. Oh, I have to go to pastor. I have to go to apostle. I have to go to my covering. I have to go to my district overseer. For what? Why do you have to go to them? Because you've been trained that these people who are above you, you have to qualify for the power that they have. But that's not what you just read. Calm down, Kevin. All right, I will. <laughs> I'll calm down. See, all of this I had to come into later on in life that because I was just like you back in the day. I believe that my spiritual leaders had the ultimate power and they were the spiritual authority and they were the spiritual covering and they were all of this mumbo jumbo. And I'm supposed to wait till 5, 10, 15, 20 years being a Christian. Don't have to do much, but I have to be qualified for this power via my time in Christianity. But that is not what I read. Not only that. Jesus gave a devil power. When I say devil, I mean Judas Iscariot, who he knew that would betray him. He gave them this power instantly. He says, behold, I've given, them, I've given you power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all, not some, all man of disease. So Kevin, why is it that the church is laden with sick people every week and throughout the week, they're being carted to, 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 to cemeteries, to graveyards. Christians dying from stage one, two, three, and four cancers, diabetes, high blood pressure. Why aren't the people of God using the power? Because they're trained that the only person who have the power, who ain't even using it either, is the head of the church. They don't believe that they have this power. They don't believe that they have this spiritual endowment. That if they follow the rules, they could do the exact same thing that Jesus did. In fact, Jesus said, you will do greater than what I did if you harness this power. So watch this. I'm playing with you all tonight. So he says, and when he had called unto him, Matthew 10 verse 1. His disciple, when he had called unto him, sorry, go too fast, Kevin, calm down. And when he had called unto him, his 12 disciples he gave them what? Power against who? Unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Everything. Now watch this now. He gave them that power, right? Now I want you to see this. He's going to now give them a protocol in which or how this power is going to be harnessed or harvest. So what we're about to read, what he's saying is, I'm giving you power, Kevin, but I don't want you to think you could just go there and just say, be here right now, in the name of Jesus, and doing a bunch of foolishness. No, let's look at verse, let's look at verse 7. He says, and as ye go preach, he's giving a protocol, these are the rules of engagement, 
to harness this power. Because as you're going to see in Matthew 17, clearly the disciples did not follow the protocol. Hence, the power that they were given and were resident in them could not be activated to heal the boy. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. So in verse 9 of Matthew 10, he says, sorry, verse 7, Jesus speaking, he says, and as you go, meaning that as you go to heal these people and so on, preach, preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So this here, Jesus, this was Jesus's model because everywhere he went, the first thing he did was taught the people, teach the people. He had to get the seed in them, the real seed, which is the word of God. He had to get them to believe. Yes, I can heal you, but do you believe that I, Jesus Christ, can heal you? This is key. You shouldn't be focused on, I just want to be healed. No, not just want to be healed. Who can heal you? Because if you came there believing that Kevin could heal you, you got a problem. If you came there believing that your pastor could heal you, you have a major problem. I believe through Kevin, I believe through pastor, Jesus Christ can heal me. Now you're talking sense now. Now you're talking sense. Now you're setting up yourself to be healed, delivered, and set free. But it couldn't happen for you over the years because your trust was in this man or this woman or this building or whatever it is that you're all dealing with. And that is not the way to engage the healing power of the Lord Jesus Christ. So verse 7 of Matthew 10 says, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what's going to happen next? Heal the sick. Okay, I hear you. I hear you. Why did he put verse 7 there? Why didn't he not put that there? Because you already got the power. Why didn't he say, now that I've already given you power, now you go out there and start healing these people? No, because there was a protocol that the church hate. They hate protocols. They hate rules. They hate regulation. And that's why they're a super failure, following a fruitless routine week after week, conclave after conclave, service after service, convention after convention. And the only purpose of those things is to show off their clothing and foolishness. But there is absolutely no change. There is no mending of marriages. There's no healing. There's no deliverance. There's no financially being debt free. There's no abundant life. Zero. Why, Mr. Ewing? Because it's all about self. It got nothing to do with the rules. They hate rules. They hate rules. They hate rules. So he says, as you go preaching, verse 7 of Matthew 10, saying the kingdom of God is at hand. Now heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils freely. Watch the next rule now. Watch the next rule. The rule, the next rule now, he says, freely you have received, freely, freely I gave you, Jesus Christ. He says, I've empowered you freely. I didn't charge you for it because this is a part of the rules of healing and, 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 and casting out devils and so on. The first thing he says, you need to now preach my word, teach the people, teach them. Don't give them your version of the scriptures. Point them like Kevin do. You point them to the rules. And just like Kevin do, you point them back to me. You don't point them to you. You don't give them stupid stuff like this cloth that you have. If you purchase this, you'll be healed. This oil you have, if you put this inside of your, uh, your, your washer and you wash your clothes, it, devils are going to run. That is not the protocol to bring about the healing and the freeing you of evil spirits. So in the second protocol, he said, now let me be clear now. The first protocol, now that you have the power... Go preaching the kingdom of God. Preach my word. And once you start preaching, watch what's going to happen now. People are going to be healed and devil and set free based on the power. Because what you're doing is now harnessing that power in you. Watch what he says next now. Now freely I gave you that gift. Don't you dare charge these people. Do you see that today? There's a proliferation of it. Proliferation. No shame. So what happens? There's no healing. That's what happens. There will be no healing. There will be no deliverance. There will be no restoration of marriages. Divorce will peak in the church more than in the secular world. Yeah, they'll preach on it all the time. Oh, if you divorce, you this, you that. But guess what? You are harnessing divorce because you refuse to follow the rules of God to prevent the devils of divorce from invading the marriages of the people. 
And I don't think these leaders know that they have to give an account one day. Jesus said it here, freely I have given you this power in John 10 verse 1. I am now commanding you as a part of the protocol to execute the, the, the assignment I've placed in you. Please, please freely give it to them. Scripture. Rules. So let's go back here now to uh, Matthew 17, right? Let's go back here to Matthew 17. <sighs> okay? So watch this, verse 15. The, just after the, the, the disciples failed to heal the man's son. So verse 15, the man said, Lord, he meaning Jesus, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and so are vexed. For oftentimes he followed into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples and they could not cure him. That is a disgrace. But what it says to me, it tells me, the minute I read that, first thing that came to my mind, a group of 12 that refused to follow the rules. They got so fascinated that they had power. They were more probably caught up on title and they got power and they could just do all kind of foolishness, right? Watch this, verse 17. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless. And to get a more deeper understanding of this, I, I did a, a video, I think last week, called uh, Lord Help My Unbelief, right? And there's another one called Fate or Faithless, something, whatever. Anyway, watch that video because I go into more depth in this verse 17 that I cannot do now because I want to get to my other points. So verse 17 of Matthew 17 says, Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless, and perverse generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him here to me. So clearly Jesus is frustrated here, but why is he really frustrated? Well, when you break down the word faithless and perverse, you will see that what it meant was that the disciples, the reason why they couldn't heal this boy is because they did it their way, meaning that they didn't follow that protocol that I just gave you in uh, Matthew 10 verses seven to nine. So Jesus is frustrated, like, how long do I have to be with you? How long I've been taking you to Bethany, Capernaum, all over the place. You saw me sit or stand and teach the people. And right after you saw me did that, I went right out there and started healing them. And I never charged them a penny. So what the scripture is telling me, again, forensically, that clearly they did contrary to what Jesus did. So Jesus in his frustration said, man, look here, how, how much long I can, how much long I can have to perform in front of you for you to get it? So verse 18 says, and Jesus rebuked the devil. Jesus rebuked the devil and he departed out of him. So you see the man said, his son, I want you to watch the rules of engagement because the rules of engagement is now going to identify where the real fight was. The man came then, he says, my son, uh, let me find it here now in, uh, where is it? Verse 15, he says, Lord have mercy on my son for he is a lunatic. In other words, he is crazy. But Jesus, who understand the rules of spiritual warfare and what is what the real problem was, G, the Bible says Jesus rebuked, listen, verse 18, the devil. Hold on, what you mean the devil and the man just tell you his son was a lunatic? His son was a nutcase. His son was crazy. Jesus says, yeah, from the outside it would appear so. And they'll probably drug him up on pills and all kinds of different names, but that will never fix his problem. His problem is spiritual. So Jesus rebuked the who? The devil, the evil spirit that inhabited this boy, suppressing his human spirit and causing him to do things he would have never done under normal circumstances. Very clear. Very clear. So this is why you see now if a demon, you, let me tell you something. If you see, let's pick your most popular church in your local place right now who scream and shout Jesus every day and and just carrying on wearing their Jesus shirt, Jesus has delivered the works, right? If you see a demon on any given Sunday or Bible study night manifest in anyone in that place, and that demon start, watch how many of them will break off running out of there. What does that tell you? Will that tell me they are fearful? Yeah, that's true. But what it tells me is that they're ignorant to the rules. How could you be running away from something that you've been given power to overcome? All I can hear is crickets. What is the purpose? This is why I'm this is why I had to walk away from the church. What is the purpose of Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, 
convention after what is the purpose of that when it's yielding zero fruit at no point at no point as nobody the people are not saying or the, the, the leaders are saying you know what we need to regroup we need to have we need to go back over this bible and see what we are doing wrong why is it that there's no form of healing deliverance people killing each other suicide murder rape uh, sodomy, witchcraft, witches, warlocks, having a field day. And the church is, mums is the word. Oh, we got to pray. Oh, trust God. God don't sleep. Right? He don't sleep. He empowered you to do what? You sit on your hide, beg for money, while the people are being carted to an early grave. Why? 99.9% of them who are dying before their time are dying because they are ignorant to the rules. Very clear. Ignorant to the rules. Ignorant to the rules. The Christian council and with every other council are jokes. They, they, they are comedy shows because what, what are you doing? What The power that Jesus gave you, what are you doing with it? Who, who are you training? Who are you instructing and empowering and giving them the protocols to go out there and fight? No, what you've done is made mammon the mediator, the fighter, the weapon. Oh man, I can't respect them, man. I cannot. I cannot respect a group of people who hide behind the cloth and they are powerless. I, I am tired of hearing uh, all of these flyers on YouTube and Facebook uh, next week on the 26th, uh, healing and deliverance. Come watch the blind see and the deaf hear. Lies! Lies. I don't never see no one come from any one of those circuses and say, listen, I went there and I was totally blind, but now I could see. I went there and I had no legs. And you see, I got two brand new legs now. Why are we not hearing this? Because they've polluted the rules, polluted the engagements of the laws, the rules, the principles, the commands. They have added and take away from the word of God. So God will never honor what he did not instituted or command so now you see why i don't attend those places they are powerless they are fruitless they yield no fruit you just go there to say i've been to church and some of you who hook on the tie you go there and say you the average person today so tell me something you say if i listen i don't know but i pay my tithe i didn't ask you if you pay your tithe do you know jesus but they're so convinced they hear about money so much that they feel money makes them okay with god when we would have just read one of the protocols was freely I give you this power. Freely you heal these people. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you right now. <sighs> Without any form of prejudice or contradiction, anybody who charge you to heal you, to deliver you from demons, is a demon. Now, let me be clear. I stand, let me tell you where I stand. I stand on Matthew, sorry, Matthew 10, verse 1. Jesus has given us all power to cast out these things, right? And I stand on the protocol of that power, which begins at Matthew 10, verse 7 to verse 9. And a part of that protocol, he's, made, he's very clear. Freely I have given you. Given me what, Jesus, what you gave me? I give you power in Matthew 10, verse 1. So watch what he says. Now you freely give this power to other people. So I'm going to say it again. I don't care who don't like it. Any clown who charges you for deliverance is a clown, is a robber, is a liar, and to top it all off, of, 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 of all of their titles and accolades, they are chief devils. The day somebody say to me, Kevin, I could, I could remove the spirit from your house from you, but I can need you to come up with some money. I am calling the police. <laughs> Did I mention immediately? I am calling the police. Yeah. This is the real scammer right here. This is the real thief and liar. I have just read the rules to you. He says, freely I have given you. And that's the reason why you don't see no change. How many times you can join that line when they call for, for, for people who are sick? How much time you won't try to see the same people up the line? Now. When, every time they say God is going to give you a financial breakthrough, I hear God. You ain't tired of being the same person on the line over and over and over again. You ain't tired of that? My God. Y'all ain't going to shame. <laughs> serious. So listen. And Jesus rebuked the devil. Watch this now. And he departed out of him. 
and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast this devil out? Watch this now. And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, mm -hmm, you didn't believe what I told you to do. What do you mean you didn't believe? I told you to go and preach the kingdom, and while preaching and healing, do not charge them. So if he tells me, if he says here, because he unbelief, that means you didn't believe what I said, meaning you didn't do what I tell you to do. So again, forensically, I have to assume if they did not believe and they did, I have to assume that they tried to do it their way. And a part of their way was they were, they were, they were uh, charging for what they were doing. He says, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed. And I remember I went into my deep teaching on this faith means not just to believe, but to believe in the son or the son of the living God. That's what you're believing in. When Jesus said to the blind man, he said, listen, he didn't say, do you believe? No, no, no. He said, do you believe I, Jesus, could heal you? Why? Because God says, I have sent my word to heal you. Who was the word? Well, according to John, uh, St. John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, Jesus was the word made flesh. So Jesus said to the man who was blind, there's a protocol here. Do you, I'm not asking if you could believe, you believe randomly or haphazardly. No, 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 no. Let's, let's zoom in here. Do you believe that I, Jesus, could heal you? And the guy said, yes, Jesus. So watch what Jesus said, because Jesus is saying now, this healing is going to be totally upon you now. He said, now, according to your faith, and when we look up that word faith, it means to have confidence and belief in God. So if you truly believe, if you truly have that kind of faith, then there should be nothing impeding you being healed. So Jesus said, according to your faith, then be it unto you. So it wasn't that Jesus didn't have the power. It wasn't that healing was impossible. But the one who's seeking to be healed or delivered from demons and evil powers, they have a role to play. But what have our churches done nowadays? No, remove that part of it. You, you need to do all that role play, all that foolishness. Bring your money here. Once you bring your money, that will supplement for you believing. <laughs> Boy, I, I don't know how you all go to these places. Honest to God, I don't know how you all do it. I don't know how you all do it. So watch this. So Jesus says, if you had faith as much as a mustard seed, you shall say unto the mountain, be thou removed, so on and so forth. Then Jesus dropped another nugget. We're just going to lead us on to our next teaching, our next uh, text. He says, now I said to you before now, I've given you power. And this power, you could cast out devils. You could heal all manner of disease and sickness. Excuse me. This is why we need to read to understand. Remember, they have the power. And Jesus is now scolding them as to why they couldn't heal. They did lack faith. They didn't believe in God. They tried to do it their own way. And that's why they came up fruitless and trying to heal this, this man's son. But then Jesus dropping another spiritual nugget or another spiritual rule of, en rule of engagement when it comes to spiritual warfare. Then Jesus says, how be it or but? He said there's an exception in this case. He says this kind will only go by prayer and fasting. So the spiritual uh, rules of engagement here is, Jesus is telling them in so much words, if you've been, if you follow the rules, you preach the word of God, you didn't collect no money for healing these people, and that devil still didn't come out, Jesus is saying now, you need to upgrade your spiritual warfare weaponry. And he just told them how. He said, there are certain kind of demons that prayer alone cannot touch. They will laugh. It remind me of, I don't know if you guys ever watched the Exorcist, right? And at one point when the, the priest was praying for over this, the, the girl who was possessed with the demon, when the priest was praying, the priest put the cross on the, on the child. And the demon said, <laughs> the demon actually laughed and cursed the priest out. And immediately that scripture came to me. This kind, this level of demonic power here will only come out through prayer and fasting. Now to back what I'm saying to you, in Ephesians 6 verse 12, 
give us gave us a hierarchy of invisible demonic powers from the kingdom of darkness. And he says, we, are, we do not wrestle or fight against flesh and blood. Humans are never our problem, no matter how disgusting they are, and no matter how much they're coming at us. Personally, I'm about to show you in a little bit that there's a force behind them. He says, instead, we wrestle against principality. Now, principality will be read under their leader, which is Satan. So you got Satan, principalities, right? Powers, rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places, right? So Jesus now saying now there is a level, there is a level of demonic hierarchy. And how will I know them? After praying and fasting, speaking and, sorry, after praying and speaking in tongues and doing all that other stuff, nothing is happening. In fact, things are getting worse. So he said, okay, now that's the sign right there. Again, now it's time to engage or take your warfare to the next level. Engage in fasting. And we can prove it right now. So with that said, let's quickly go over here. Let's quickly go over here to 2 Chronicles 20. Again, we want to make sense out of this because we want to walk away with an understanding. So I left uh, with uh, Matthew 17, verse 21, where fasting became the keynote speaker in that last passage. He said, this here is going to be the ultimate weapon. The more you, and listen, you're looking at someone right now who is a living witness of it. The more, and that's why I promote it so much. The more you engage in fasting. Fasting broke the spirit of oppression over me. Fasting break the spirit of lust, the spirit of poverty, backwardness, stagnation, anti-promotion. Fast everything that had me bound and had me almost going out of my mind. It is when I engage fasting because prior to that, I was just praying. Prior to that, I was shandalo, mandalo, all that other stuff. Prior to that, I was walking through my place, praying and crying and asking God to help me. And it wasn't that God didn't want to help me. God is sitting down and having with his hands crossed and saying, why won't Kevin upgrade his warfare by engaging in fasting? So when I started to fast, and I started to fast, was as, that was an act of desperation. I didn't even did fasting because I understood the rules of it, you know. I said, let me just do this here. Because I was frustrated. I thank God I became so frustrated that it made me want to do something different. A lot of you keep doing the same thing over and over, calling me, complaining to me and your past and everybody else. But the truth is, when you go over what you should have done, you didn't do it. And the minute you tell them, well, you need to fast, you need to, you find every excuse in the world. Well, I, you know, I'm hungry and I blah, blah, blah. Well, you're not, you're not, you don't want to, you're not serious about deliverance. You're not serious about whatever. But here is the hypocrisy in what you just said. Kevin will say to you, listen, I normally don't tell people how long to fast. That's between you and the Holy Spirit. But if you haven't heard from the Holy Spirit, my uh, suggestion would be two to three days. It's totally up to you. But you must be committed and you must erase all hate, bitterness, and forgiveness from your heart. You got, I watch them and they, their eyes go down. They're like, well, oh, I can try it. But let somebody come there and say, there are people in here. You have, I see a financial devil on your neck. Every time you put one step forward, I see in the spirit where you there's a spirit pulling you back. And this guy is going to get so theatric with you. And I hear God says that that devil, that devil is on your neck because you didn't plan to see it. If you are serious about your deliverance, if you want to see the, the, the finger of God erase your debt and the finger of God summons the angelic financial host, Sow a seed of 3,500. They will break their legs trying to get up there. But what I ask them to do, cleanse you out of all wickedness. Focus on God. Turn your plate down for two days, three days, whatever. And quote these particular scriptures based on your situation. Suck their teeth, roll their eyes, give me every excuse in the world. But they will go to the bank and borrow the $3,500. And give this clown, this thief, actually, because they've done it before and they know nothing is going to happen. Now, if that ain't bondage, then you tell me what bondage is, right? So watch this. Let's go to Second Chronicles 20, beginning at verse 1. It came to pass that after this also, that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them other besides the Ammonites, 
came against Jehoshaphat to battle. So Jehoshaphat now is the reigning king in Judah, right? At this point, the kingdom is split in two. Israel is the northern kingdom. Judah, if I believe, is the southern kingdom. And I believe at this time, I'm not mistaken, I believe Ahab would have been the king of Israel at the time. I'm not sure. I stand to be correct. But anyway, Judah, who is king is Jehoshaphat, as you would see, these nations has now joined alliance to come against them. Moab, the children of Ammon, and listen, and with them, with the children of Ammon and Moab, there were, there were others beside the Ammonites. So it's Moab, the, the Moab, the children of Ammon, the Ammonites, and there were other nations. All of them joined forces and say, we're going to shut this dude down. Now, I can take my time here because now I'm going to bring you to the spiritual part of this before I go any further. Now, even though Judah was a fraction in size compared to this conglomerate of other nations that's coming against them. But to understand where I'm about to take you, I'm going to pull you away from the physical part of this right now. Because when we go into this story, based on the fasting, based on everything I told you so far, it's going to make perfect sense to you. Remember I said to you in Ephesians 6 verse 12, it starts off by saying, for we the believers of God, the believers of Jesus Christ, the believers of the kingdom of God, we must be clear in our mission, clear in our faith, clear in what we have signed on to. And that is, we have now said, as believers of Christ, our focus, our fight, and everything else that we could think of, our focus must be on the unseen world. That's the key to everything. Our warfare, everything originates, begin right over there. Every, No matter who is coming at us, behind them, there's a force that we cannot see that's influencing them. We, on the other hand, have forces also. And the, 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 the church should be teaching us this. And if we, if we drill this in people the way we beg for seed, we'll have more successful, fruitful Christians. So, so far, you see a minimum of, of three nations, there are more that's coming against Judah. Now, this is powerful because in your mind, all you're thinking about, Judah also, this whole group of people coming against a small Judah, right? So watch this. So verse 2 says, Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, They come it, there come it a great multitude. Now, I'm telling you this because I want you to see the spiritual implication. Remember what I always tell you. Every time the enemy come at you, the first group of powers that he sent is the spirit of fear. And that comes through negative speaking, intimidation, manipulation. That's how it's coming. That's just like right now. You have a doctor's report that they're going to give you the results for tomorrow. You haven't slept for the part from the time you took that exam or you took that test. So... Where you should be having faith and confidence in the word of God, the devil already sent out his foot soldiers, which are the spirits of fear. So verse 2 of 2 Chronicles 20, Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea of this side Syria. And behold, they be in whatever that big word is, which is in Enjadai, all right? Verse 3, and Jehoshaphat did who? And Jehoshaphat did what? He succumbed. fear. Now, in your mind, you immediately put fear, according to the dictionary, as an emotion. And yes, he did have that emotion. But his emotion of fear, I really want you to hear this part. Remember, think spiritually. His emotion of fear was just evidence that the spirits of fear was there before the Syrian army, sorry, before the other armies came at him. There were spiritual forces that had already invaded the land before the physical forces came. Why are you trying to help you today? I'm trying to get you to focus on the real enemy. Let's read it again. The Bible says, verse 3, and Jehoshaphat, after hearing this negative news, after hearing this great army, after hearing all this nonsense, because he should have shut that down a long time, it says, and Jehoshaphat feared. 
But I love what he did next. And set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim a who? Proclaim a what? Proclaim a fast. Boy, I loving it. I loving it. So it tells me Jehoshaphat got some spiritual knowledge. Jehoshaphat says, now hold on now. There's no way in the world I could defeat this physical army. Because clearly they're greater than us. But he also realized that behind this army, there is an invisible demonic force. Well, Kevin, how could you assume that? Because the Bible says he now set his face to go fast. And the only reason why you're going to fast is to invite greater spiritual power. I'm trying to help you. Oh, I'm trying to help you now. Now, let's put a pin in there because I need to make this baby make sense, okay? Put a pin in there. We're coming right back here. We're coming back to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 3. But I'm going to read it one more time. I'm going to read it one more time. And Jehoshaphat feared he was afraid and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout all Judah. I need you all to come together and come in agreement because now we are about to invite the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the spiritual powers, to overcome this other opposing power. Remember, our fight is not against flesh and blood. Okay, so let's 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 just jump to this. Let me give you the the background to all of this. So let's go to Second Kings. Let's go to Second Kings chapter six. Second Kings chapter six, right? Second Kings chapter six, all right? Okay, so I just want to give you some background now because this is going to correlate with the story we just read. Uh, Elijah, right? Watch this. Where are we now? So Elijah, E-L-I-S-H-A, not Elijah, Elijah. Elijah had just escaped the Syrian army who were, who were after him because he always prophesy to the captain of the army of Israel every time the Syrian army tried to ambush them. The captain of the Syrian army became so frustrated that he thought that it was someone in his camp uh, telling Israel what the deal was. So one of his soldiers said, no, 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 captain. It's the same guy, Elijah. This guy, he, he just knows the deal. So they decided to come to the city where Elijah was, the city of Dothan. And ambush him. So they figure if they knock down, if they take him out, okay, who was this uh, one who was always advising them that they'll have a better chance at Israel. Now listen carefully. And remember, what we're about to read here now is going to be the background to what we just read. Remember, the children of Ammon, the Ammonites, and the Moabites, and there were other nations that pulled together or became allies with one another. And they are now coming to shut down Judah. Some people came to Judah and says, hey, look here, this great army coming to whoop the pants off of y'all. That immediately put fear in the king, which was the head of Judah, which would have been Jehoshaphat. And like I said, the fear that he took on from a spiritual perspective, it is simple evidence that his feeling of fear was evidence that the spirit of fear, this was the part of the invisible army, the foot soldiers of the kingdom of darkness, spiritual forces that had already invaded the land of Judah before the physical forces came. So watch this. So in 2 Kings 6, verse 15, and when the servant of the man of God was risen. Now, who is the servant and who is the man of God? The man of God would have been Elijah. His servant, even though they don't have his name here, this was Gehazi, all right? It says, and when the servant of the man of God was risen and gone forth, listen, listen, behold, a house compassed the city, both with horses and chariots, right? So what is the Bible saying? The Bible says that Elijah's servant got up that morning and he went outside, probably to stretch or whatever. And when he looked, he saw the entire Syrian army surrounding them in the city of Dothan. He became so frantic and fearful. So you see now the spirits of fear already at the door of Elijah and his servant, while the physical army of Syria has surrounded them. Watch this now. It says in verse 15, And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city both with horses and chariot. And his servant, Elijah's servant, said unto him, which is Elijah, Alas, my master. 
how shall we do or what shall we do now? It's just me and you, Elijah. Clearly we are done because this entire physical army is here. But more so, based on the young man's fear, the spirit of fear had already taken a hold of him. Listen to my homeboy, Elijah, in the next verse. So in verse 16, listen. And he answered, I love it. Who is this he? Mr. Elijah. Elijah was between 82 and 85 years old at this time. Elijah, now, was anyone who should have been afraid, it should have been Elijah because he is much older, much more fragile. But this man saw beyond the physical realm. I love it. Watch this. So verse 16 says, and he, which is Elijah, answered. Answered who? Answered the young man, Gehazi, who was fearful. What did he do? He says, now, the first thing you do, homeboy, is you disable this nasty spirit of fear that is consuming your mind that is preparing you for defeat, that is making you fearful of the unknown and the size of that group. It's a demon on you. Whoa, back up. Back up, Elijah. There's too much to unpack here. And furthermore, at least give me some time to deal with my fear before all of this information you're giving me. Okay, watch this. And he, which is Elijah, answered, fear not. What are you saying? Shut that dumb spirit down shut that fearful because your fear is evidence your emotion of fear is evidence that the spirit of fear is present i try to help you tonight listen and he answered verse 16 of second king 6 fear not for they talk to me elijah Talk to me, because sound like Elijah giving some, some cryptic messages here, some coded message, but he ain't no coded nothing. He talking from a spiritual perspective. He said, boy, now look here, listen to me carefully. Elijah had to rough him up a little bit. I think he gave him a couple of slaps too. So Elijah says, hey, fear not. Uh-huh, go ahead, Elijah. For they, I love it, circle that word they, because he's talking about another group now. Remember, party A was the Syrian army. Party B was Elijah and the servant. But Elijah is talking about the behind the scenes group here on both sides, on his side and the Syrian army side. So watch this, verse 16. And he, Elijah, answered the servant. He says, fear not. Why? For they that be with us. Elijah, you sure you're not know, something to drink? Because you're talking foolishness right now. And these dudes are there about to whoop our behind. No, 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 calm down. I told you to, do, to, to disable that fear. Now listen to me carefully. They that be with me and you, boy, there is, a, there is an invisible group here. There's an angelic host here. Our spiritual helpers are present with us. Now it makes sense why Elijah was so confident, even though they were outnumbered, probably 10, 20,000 to one. He said, they that be with us are more than they that be with them. So what is he saying? Elijah saying, the invisible army young man that God has assigned to us that you cannot see, outnumber listen the listen the wording he says they are more than they that be with the syrian army meaning that the angelic host outnumber the invisible demonic forces that's influencing the syrian army am i making myself clear do you see it I, I don't want to go no further until you get it. I can take my time as a teacher, a gifted one if I might add, because I need this to assimilate into your cerebral cortex. Because what you're seeing here is the format for all spiritual warfare. This is why Ephesians 6, 12 say, hey, 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 calm down. You cussing Mary, you cussing the boss, you cussing your wife, you cuss. That's not the real problem. There is a force with them. But there's also a force with you. But it appeared to me, by you cussing her, it seems as if you're ignoring the forces that are with you who are willing to wait for you. And you're being influenced by the evil spirit that's with this person here. I trying to help you. I trying to help you. So watch what he says here, man. This is, man, this is so juicy. I so love this. 
So watch this now, verse 17. And Elijah, because Elijah realized this boy ain't getting it. Elijah prayed. This is 2 Kings 6, verse 17. But listen to Elijah's verbiage or his statement again. And Elijah prayed and said, what did he say? Lord, I got to call you because this is boy, something wrong with him. Lord, I pray, uh-huh, thee, open his eyes that he may see. Oh, whoa, man, you messing me up. Didn't this dude just tell you what he saw outside? Did, did he not tell you that? So what do you mean, Lord, open his eyes for him to see what he just told you what he saw? Yeah, you would say the same thing too if you're still thinking from a natural, physical perspective. And the Bible has now just been decoded in this particular passage to tell you now, he is now asking God, now God, because there are two sides that you have. There's the one where you physically see, then there's your spiritual sight. One where you see in dreams or one where you see in vision. So now he's about to have a vision. He's saying, our Lord, open his eyes. Let him see the reality of what's taking place here. Watch this. So verse 17, and Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. What did he see? And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots. Of who? Of what? Of fire round about Elijah. My God. So this invisible horses and chariots, this was the army of the Lord that nobody else could see. Elijah saw it. And now the boy is being privy to it. All of this in the spiritual world that they, no one else except them could see. Oh man, y'all ain't listening to me. Y'all ain't, y'all ain't safe. Because <laughs> if y'all was, if y'all was excited, y'all should have at least done four to five cartwheels right now. This scripture is showing the reality of what you signed on to. Don't mind that foolishness you're all doing in church. That screaming and shouting that's producing nothing. All of that fool gossiping and conferences and all of that means nothing if there is nothing being yielded from it. If there is no fruit from it. The Bible wants you to come back right here to basis. This is where your focus should be. Whenever we have conferences and conclaves and seminars, it should be to refresh us in spiritual warfare. So now when we leave from here, after being refreshed, we're going to go cut some people hip right now. Spiritually, that is. But you don't, you don't hear this kind of preaching no more. You hear, see it, see it, see it, see it, right? So now, with that said, let's go back now, because it can make sense now. Let's go back to 2 Chronicles 20. Let's go back to 2 Chronicles 20, and we're going to pick up from verse 3 again, all right? Now watch this. And Jehoshaphat fed, so do you see the spirit of fear on him like it was on Gehazi, Elijah's servant, right? And But in this case, he overcame his fear, at least to the point where he said, you know what? It's time I go on the Lord's side, right? So he says, and Jehoshaphat fed and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout all Judah. So the fast now, just like it said in... Uh, Matthew 17, verse 21, Jesus says, listen, this kind will only come out through prayer and fasting. So let's break it down a little bit more, Matthew 17, verse 21, to make sense in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 3. Jehoshaphat fed, but he didn't become paralyzed with his fear. What I'm reading here, it says, his fear caused him to set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout all Judah. But why are you fasting? Jesus said, I want you to get it. This kind will only come out through prayer and fasting. Stop right there. This kind. So if Jehoshaphat is going on a fast, Jehoshaphat must be aware that there is a Special kind of demonic powers that's coming with this group. In fact, his fear indicated that some of them had already arrived. So Jehoshaphat, who's clearly spiritually inclined, says, you know what? We need to get all, is, all Judah on one accord and proclaim a fast 
because we need to invoke our spiritual helpers. Mighty God, y'all well, need to be, y'all should have been back flipping at this point. Y'all should have been at least doing the tree and a half quarter twist right here. Watch this. Verse four of second Chronicles 20. And Judah gathered themselves together, uh-huh, to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Verse 5, and Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. Verse 6 of 2 Chronicles 20, and said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? You see, when your fears and the opposition that is so great come upon you, Listen, you get personal now with God. You want into, oh Lord, great Jews or Elohim, El Shaddai, the great one of Israel. No, 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 no. See, you got to put all that on the side and you got to get raw now. You got to get royal now because you realize you don't got the time for all that. God, I need you to hear me right now. God, I need you to show up now. I believe that you are God and I believe there's no power. I believe that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. No weapon form against me. See, that's how you come before the throne. You come like a confident soldier. You come that, hey, look here. While you may use me, the power ain't coming from me. The power coming from you. So I need you to show up. If there's any time I need you, I need you to show up now. So he says, and said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven, and rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen. Stop right there. Stop right there. Stop right there. Stop right there and read it again. You hear what Joseph I just said? You all miss it. Let's go to verse 6 again. This is Joseph at praying. He says, and said, this is Joseph at, Oh God, he's praying. Oh Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? He's asking a question. But of course, that's a rhetorical question. And rulest, not only are you the God of heaven and the kingdom of heaven, listen, and rulest not thou over all all the kingdoms of the heathen? Let me know when you all get it before I go any further. <laughs> you all still ain't getting it. Jehoshaphat is saying, you are sovereign. And sovereign simply means, in layman's term, you don't answer to nobody. You control you run everything. So he's saying, are you not the God of heaven? But again, that's rhetorical. That isn't nothing for God to answer because we all know that. But then he made the statement. He says, you are also, you also rule us over all of the kingdoms. You rule over all of the kingdoms of the heathen. What is he saying? You rule over the voodoo man house. You rule over the sangoma. You rule over the witchcraft worker, the witch, the warlock. There is no authority outside of the sovereignty of God, is what he's saying. <laughs> Boy, listen. I think you're all serious. You all, you, all, you all listen to this? Listen to this. Listen carefully. Verse 6 of 2 Chronicles 20. This is Jehoshaphat praying to God. And said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? And rulest not over all of the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? Verse 7 of 2 Chronicles 20. Art not thou our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before, they, before thy people Israel, and gave us it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend forever? And they dwelt therein, and have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name's sake? If when evil cometh upon us as the sword, judgment of pestilence or famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our afflictions, then thou wilt hear and help. Verse 10 of 2 Corinthians 20, 2 Chronicles 20, sorry. And now behold, the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say how they reward us. 
In other words, look how ungrateful they are. We spared their lives, but now they're coming to attack us. Behold, verse 11, behold, I saw, I say, how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. O our God, will thou not judge them? For we have no might, let's be clear, against the great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do. But our eyes are set upon thee. In other words, he's saying, listen, we would be foolish to believe that we could physically overtake them. Our total confidence, God, is in you right now. And you see, somebody need to hear that right now. Somebody who dealing with some sickness right now, who dealing with marital problems, financial problems, children getting locked up and on murder charges, this is how you need to talk to your God. You have to strip yourself to the core and realize to yourself, I am nothing without God. I am hopeless without God. I don't care how much title I have. I don't care how much money I have. Without God, I am defeated. And that's where the king stood. I love this. I, I so love this. So watch this. Verse 12. Oh, our God, will thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Verse 13 of Second Chronicles 20. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. They're all on one accord. I love it. Verse 14. Then upon Jehiel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benani, and the son of Jeiel, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asap, came the spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. So God is showing up now. So you, I hope you're watching it. I want you to see the spiritual implication behind everything. These demonic powers are coming against them. Aside from the physical uh, nations who've allied together to come. They now did the rules of engagement by going on a fast and beseeching or invoking or calling upon their God. And just like God told us over and over, remind me of my word. Remind me what I have done. So Jehoshaphat protocols now go into, this is what you have done. And this is what they have done to us. Would you allow them to do this? He's reminding God of his word. He ain't coming there talking about he's the great prophet of so-and-so. And when he anoints you, you have to be healed and touch not God's anointed and all this garbage. No. He's following a protocol and the protocol that he followed invoke the presence of God, in this case, through the prophet. Watch this. So verse, so verse 14 again, in the latter part it says, uh, a Levite of the son of Asap came, came the spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, this is now the Levite guy, right? Who had the spirit of the Lord upon him. And he said, hearken or listen. So God is responding now through this, this prophet guy. He says, and he said, hearken ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem and thou King Jehoshaphat. Boy, I love this here. Yeah? Thus said the Lord unto you, be not what? Afraid. Shut down the spirit of fear. Watch what he says next. Nor dismayed. What does the word dismayed mean? Confused. He said, this, this is the first uh, strategy of the enemy. Once he invokes fear on you, that by default brings confusion because you don't know what to do now. The thoughts are racing, fear, anxiety. You're thinking the worst. You fear the unknown. You look at the size of these people. You think, they look at your boss and this is the managing director came down from personnel just to see you in the office. All of this fear dealing with you. So God says, through his servant, we can disable fear right here. Shut it down. Fear, I rebuke you right now. Fear, I realize that you are spirit. And my emotion of fear that is flaring up right now is just the evidence that you're here. But in the name of Jesus, I come against you, fear. I refuse to think that my doctor's report tomorrow is going to read cancer. It's going to read HIV. It's going to read some terminal Ill, Ill disease. I reject those thoughts. I take authority over you, fear. And I reject you. You spirit of confusion that accompany your homeboy, fear, you must get to. Spirit of confusion, I come against you. For God did not give us the spirit of fear, and he is a God of order. 
I command order to take over my mind in the name of Jesus. That's how you should be dealing with it right now. Because when you behave that way, you're realizing now your fight isn't physical. Your fight is spiritual. And you're dealing with the root of your problem. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you here. So watch this now. Verse 15, and he said, How can ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem and thou King Josephat? Thus said the Lord unto you, be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. For the battle, I love it, I love it. For the battle is not yours. Who the battle belong to, sir? It is God. Now, what do you mean? It's the people coming behind us. Jehoshaphat and Judah. Yeah, I know that. But this is still not your battle. It is I, God, and my kingdom against the kingdom of darkness. They're only using both parties. You've invited me to for me to work through you as well as they had invited them to work through them. So what is this also telling me? It also tells me that these nations, and it makes perfect sense, who served other gods, has conjured up their spirits to enable them to overcome Judah. See, the more you think spiritually, the more it's going to make sense to you now. So God is telling them, now that you have called me on the scene to come and help you, let us get this straight from the get-go. Meaning that, don't you get involved anymore. I got this now. So he says, be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Verse 16 of 2 Chronicles 20. Tomorrow, he's instructing them now. He's giving them instructions. See, that's how protocol works. Protocol isn't you just jumping on the seam and bragging about your titles and who all you heal and how much money God give you and you ride in Mercedes. No. Spirit, true spiritual warfare is God. I, I need to hear from you. I need the instructions going forward. In other words, I need you to direct my path. So there's a rule here that's being followed according to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. And what does that rule say? And what is it called again? The rule of direction or the rule of instruction. Same thing. It says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, which is what they did. Lean not on thine own understanding, which is what they did. In all thy ways, acknowledge God, which is what they did. And what is going to be harvested from this? Now God will direct your part. Did God direct their part because they say direct their part? No. They followed a protocol. They followed spiritual laws. They engaged the rules. I would... I would love to see when the church come back to the Bible. I would love when to see the church come back to the rules and remove the hype, remove the theatrics, remove the parent pageantry, remove the circus performance. Bring us back to the rules. Preacher, tell us, like Kevin is telling us, look at the rules, follow the rules, and the rules will give you this result. What is the purpose of the law and the rules that I told you the last time I spoke to you? It is to invoke a predetermined outcome. I want direction from you, God. He says, no problem. So here's the rules you follow. Trust me with all your heart. One, lean not on your understanding. Two, in all your ways, acknowledge me. Three, now, now I'm going to show up and direct you. But you don't say, hey, come direct me. No, 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 no. According to spiritual warfare, there has to be protocols, rules that we follow. And I promise you none of them in, in, entails money. None. Talking mess. Have respect for the law. Have respect for the rules. I want to know the rules. I don't want to hear no hocus pocus. Don't bring me no oil. Don't bring me no water. Don't bring me no cloth. Don't bring me no Jesus glove and socks and scarf. I want the rules. That's it. What rules for healing? What rules for amending this marriage? What rule for restoring it? What rules to fix my finances? Please give me the rules. Don't tell me money. Don't tell me shofar. Don't tell me oil. Don't tell me uh, Jesus, Jerry, curl juice. Don't tell me none of that. Give me the rules. Oh, I ain't coming here no more. In fact, I'm leaving right now. No longer, you have to take the same attitude. I refuse to sit in any church. And when it comes to healing and deliverance, they are substituting the rules for items. It's time for me to go. It's time for me to go. I have lived too long, suffered too much, been to the same cycle over and over to sit down for another round of 
Bottom and Bailey Circus. No, it's not going to happen. If that church is not telling me the rules, there's no reason for me to be there. Absolutely none. Unless I love to waste my time and I take a delight in losing in life, then that's the place I should be. But if I want to win in life, I must seek a church that is teaching me the rules, the laws, the principles of God. Because every last one of those rules embedded in them, if I follow, is a predetermined end result. Predetermined. It's built in the rules. Predetermined. Very simple. Predetermined. Predetermined meaning that you will get that result if you follow this rule. When you go to the food store, I use this example all the time, and you want to bake a Betty Crocker cake. You've never baked cake before in your life. You don't know what to do. So they fix that for you. They show you on the box. You see that? You see how pretty that cake look? Excuse me. You see the nice little yellow uh, thing on the inside and the nice little chocolate on the outside? Now turn over because you don't just go make that off of your own will. Turn over and we have itemized the rules. So much so, a uh, 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 quarter butter, uh, this amount of water, this amount of sugar, and then you mix these ingredients together until you get a certain texture, and then you butter up the pan, put your oven on 350, let that preheat, follow the rules. Now, if you follow every rule that we would have told you on this box, you have to get the same cake as an end result that you see on this box. But don't go and say, well, mama used to put, you know, they asking for a quarter salt, but mama used to put half a teaspoon and, and put some milk in it to make it a little spongy and you're not going to get the same results. You're not. So this is why you, you see, I blame you. I don't blame the preachers no more. I blame you. I don't blame no preacher. I don't blame no apostle. Anyone who is robbing you, anyone who is lying to you, anyone who you sat under for years and you have yet to receive a miracle, a deliverance, breakthrough, you have yet to win a soul for the kingdom, I don't blame them no more. I don't blame them. They're guilty, but I don't blame them. I blame you. I blame you. I blame you. Because you make no demands on the word of God. Pastor, why are you always asking me? Because I will tell him. Why you? Why when it comes to healing, you always asking us for money? Why? Why can't we just follow the rules? Why you can't teach us about faith? Teach us how we trust in God, especially those of us who have difficulty and challenges with unbelief. Teach us the right. Why? Why everything is money, money, money? And when you tie it and you see we come, and then you 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 figure well, okay, they ain't just give me the money just so. So let me bring in four bottles of olive oil and put them in small containers and charge them six trillion dollars for each one. Why can't you just give me the rules? Why is this so difficult? Give me what the book, you, you have been gifted with a book to teach me from. In fact, the burden ain't even on you because the truth is you didn't write the book. All you have to do is tell me what the book say. Why is this so difficult? Why every Sunday, every week is a, just the same garbage over and over? I come in this place. The same clown come up there. The spirit of the Lord is here. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. I hear God say, and Jesus say this, and God say that. The guy come, the soloist come, they sing, they play the keyboard. Right after that, the preacher come on and go into the next two hours of replacing the word of God with money, with items, with crickets, with dolls, with teddy bears, Jesus draws socks, Jericho juice, um, uh, Mary of Magdalene weave, uh, Peter of Samaria uh, boxes. Why can't you just give me the word of God? Why? So I have to blame you folks. That's why I quit that garbage 11 years ago. I, I, I had to, uh, listen, there was no way in this world, 10 years ago, I was 42. All right. I couldn't see me spending my next 10 years, which would have made me 53. I'll be 53 in September. I could not see, I could not envision in my mind sitting under another hopeless service, another service of give and see, another service of IOU, another services of God getting ready to do. He always in the starting block, but for some reason he gets stalled right there. I couldn't take that no more. So my frustration placed a demand on my decision making. You could stay here for the next 10 years till you're 53 saying God is getting ready to do. 
Or you could leave all of this saying that they don't want to follow the rules and you follow the rules yourself. Watch this. Verse 16. The prophet says, Tomorrow go ye down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz, and ye shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jurel. Verse 17 of 2 Chronicles 20. Ye shall not need to fight. Now this is interesting because what you're going to see here is exactly what you saw in our 2 Kings, all right, 6, with uh, Elijah and his servant. Where Elijah said, there are more that are with us than those that are with them, right? Verse 70 says, ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord. That word so much means deliverance. See the deliverance of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear, watch again, fear not, nor be dismayed. So for him to make that statement, again, it is evidence that the spirit of fear and confusion, they're present in Judah, even though those who send them, the physical armies of Ammon, the Ammonites, and the Moabites in the other nation, they're on the way, but they send the intimidators, the invisible beings. So God is now, through this prophet, is saying to them, now listen, to be on one accord, you cannot be confused by fear and anxiety. Collectively shut it down now. Watch this. So he says, you shall not, you shall not need to fight in this battle. Verse 17, set yourself, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. Now, do you think they're going to see the Lord? No. So what is the prophet saying? You must have faith. You must believe that even though you see a physical entourage of nations coming against you, shut fear down, because fear is trying to make you compare the size of your group with that big army. And the purpose of that as an end result is to instill fear in you because you know your six people cannot match up with the 66,000 people. So he says, shut that down and be assured that tomorrow you will show up. You wouldn't be fighting. The Lord will be with you. In other words, the spiritual angelic host, your spiritual helpers is about to show up. I love this. Verse 18, and Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. So that means they were convinced. Verse 19. And the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. So this is so beautiful because their behavior, this is so powerful. Their behaving as if they won already. <laughs> I love it. I love it. See, that's how you got to be. See, you got to behave. See, when they come in your face, oh, you will never get that promotion. Yeah? Stay right there. I can be your boss one day, chief. Watch and see. Yeah, yeah, they'll fire you. We'll see who will be fired. See, you got to talk with confidence. You got to talk with boldness. You tell them, well, I got a doctor's report because this little bump under my chest here and the person next door, your cousin, well, you know, Tom had that bump too and you see he did. Well, what that have to do with me? You and Tom, get out of here. I rebuke all two of y'all. Come with that negative garbage around me. I will believe the report. See, you got to shut it down. God told his prophet to tell them, deal with fear and deal with confusion. Shut it down because if you don't, it will deal with you. It will deal with you. God need a, a cooperation with those. You don't summons God, right? And what did God, what, what is the next rule of engagement? What is another one when it comes to spiritual warfare? God says, you are heirs with me and joint heirs with Christ, right? In other words, he said, this is a partnership. Now I can show up, but what I need you to do is eliminate this fear. What I need you to do is move this confusion out of the way. I, I can't. We are not working in tandem or in harmony if you still got doubt and fear and all that stuff. That's why Peter sank. 
because he had doubt, he had fears. So God says, let's deal with your mind. So before we go do the spiritual warfare, let's deal with your mind. Father God, I pray right now that you empower me with the spirit of peace. Your word declares in the book of Philippians that it is only you that can give that peace that passes all understanding. Father, endow me, overwhelm me with peace. I need it because it's very difficult for me to get over it's fail. Your word declares in Isaiah 26 verse 3, you said that you will keep me in perfect peace as long as my mind is stayed upon thee. So I see this as a partnership. You want to give me perfect peace, but you said in order to qualify for it, I need to keep thinking about you. Father, help me. And you know what he can tell you? Okay, we'll keep reading the word. Keep listening to the word on YouTube. Listen to people I point you to. Listen to Kevin and listen to those who's bringing you back to the word, who's showing you that the power is in me and not them, who's telling you to recite the word in your prayer, who's telling you to saturate yourself because when you do that, you now engaging in the principle that if I keep my mind on him, now he's going to give me this perfect peace or complete peace. Psalms 119 verse 165. Listen now. Perfect peace there in uh, Isaiah. Philippians says, peace that passes all understanding. Psalms says, Psalms 119 verse 165, he says, great peace. Watch this. Great peace have they, that who? Which love thy law, thy word. Great peace. He says, keep listening to it. Keep listening. Keep listening. Keep listening to the tapes. Keep listening to the videos. Listen to the word of God. Shut down the TV. No more YouTube unless you're watching uh, gospel people. Shut down Facebook and because you got more fear right now and, and gorge on the, the, the word of God because you're feeding your human spirit. So he says in Psalms 119 verse 165, great peace have they which love thy law, thy rules, thy commandments, thy precepts. And listen, listen, nothing shall offend them. So how do I disable the spirit of offense in my life? I must gorge on the word of God which shall empower me with great peace. So what is the Bible really saying? Wherever there's a spirit of offense, there's no peace. I love scripture. Y'all don't know, yeah? I love it. You have no idea how much I, I love it. And that's why I get so excited and passionate about it. I love it because I have seen it work for me. And that's why I could teach with such passion. I have proven this over and over and over again without money. <laughs> yeah, throw that in there, all right? So watch this now. The Bible says, and the Levites, no, in verse 20, it says, and they rose early in the morning. So this is verse 20 of 2 Chronicles 20. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa, as instructed. And as they went forth, listen, Jehoshaphat stood and said, hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God so shall you be established or set up. Believe his prophet, the one who just told us that instructions, believe his prophet, so shall you prosper. Believe his prophet, meaning now, believe what the prophet, the man of God, has told you, who spoke as a mouthpiece of God, and prosperity will be our portion. So on the way there, he stopped. He probably had a revelation. He probably had an epiphany. He said, hold on, stop a minute. I just, God just downloaded something to me. He said, believe God and we will be established. But believe what this prophet just said, knowing that that's God speaking through him, and we will be prosperous in all of this. Watch this, verse 21. And when he had consulted with the people, who was he? Jehoshaphat, their king. He appointed singers unto the Lord. Now hold on, what you doing now? Sound like you setting up to have a party and they ain't even had the war yet and you haven't even attained victory yet. So it sounds like this is a man, you gotta get it who was seeing through spiritual eyes. He saw the end from the beginning. I saw the victory. Therefore, I'm going to have a pre-party. Watch this. I so love Joseph. So Joseph said in 2 Chronicles 20 verse 21, and when he, which is Joseph, had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, and that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and to say, praise the Lord for his mercies endured forever. And when they began to sing and to praise the Lord and to praise, listen, listen, I love it. No, I love it because now they're rejoicing. See, and that's what God is seeking. God is seeking a confident people. Listen, even though you may have some fear in you, right? 
still give him glory. Father, you, you know my heart. I cannot hide how I feel right now. But I'm trusting you that the more I give you glory, the more I give you praise, the more I immerse myself in your word. The word declares that faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. I believe that the more I inject your word in me, the more my faith is going to increase, which will now dissipate or remove this fear from me. I truly believe, Father God, that that, that card that I'm believing you for, I, Father God, the next three weeks from now, I will not be hiking right anymore. I will not be catching an Uber anymore because I believe by faith. I have decreed your word. I have reminded you of your word. Now I'm going into praises right now. I'm going into glorifying you right now because I believe. And Father God, you know what? Even if I don't believe, I say and I believe. I'm going to keep doing it and saying it until I am convinced because I believe that you're going to make it happen for me. I believe that you're going to make restore my marriage. Father God, I know it's just a matter of the the the... the us going to court to finalize everything, but I believe that you could restore it. I don't believe in the judge and all these other people. My belief is in you. I believe that you could turn the heart of the judge. I believe that you could turn the heart of my wife or my husband. I believe that you could bring reconciliation. I believe, Lord. And Father God, help me to dismiss my unbelief. See, that's how you need to be talking. Father, everybody's saying my child is a troubled child. Everybody's saying that this child is going to live up the court steps and spend time in jail. Father, I, I don't believe that. I reject it. Just like how uh, Elijah told the servant, fear not. Fear not. Just like how the prophet said to Jehoshaphat in Israel, he says, fear not and be not dismayed. Do not fear and don't be confused. Father, give me the fortitude. Give me the spirit of confidence, the spirit of boldness to eradicate this fear. Because sometimes God, it feels like I have no control over it. But I reject that too. I believe that you, you will assist me in overcoming this fear. See, that's how you got to be. You can't be playing church no more. You can't be letting these fools tell you, bring money to overcome fear. Bring money to get the husband back. It is all lies and foolishness. Stop buying into that nonsense. So watch this, verse 21, and when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, and that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army, and to say, praise the Lord for his mercies endured forever, verse 22. And when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, sorry, and when they began to sing and to praise, I love this, this powerful, verse 22, watch this now, watch this, this is get juicy. And when they begin to sing and to praise, the Lord, not Jehoshaphat, the Lord, not the prophet who prophesied to them. So when I see the Lord here now, that means that the invisible power of the spiritual realm has now taken over from here. The Bible says the Lord, listen, set ambushment, that's what I'm reading, against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir which will come against Judah, and they were smitten. So let's break this down now. Let's break this down. I have to take my time because this is powerful, all right? This is powerful. I want you to listen. Now, we can read to understand right now. We ain't reading to debate. Remember, the prophet already spoke. The leader now gave the final word. The leader said, believe God, and you shall be established. Believe the prophet will represent God, and we will definitely prosper. That wasn't enough for Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat said, Nana, set up the band. We about to rock and roll right about here. I know it don't seem conducive, and it seem inappropriate. But if y'all see what I see, y'all will start partying with me right now. The Bible says, as they begin to worship, listen. The Bible says, the Lord set ambushment out. For this to make sense, we need to understand what the word ambushment mean. Ambushment is the same word as the as, as guerrilla attack. It simply means a surprise attack. Meaning that let's say you were to leave your house right now and there were a group of men hiding in the bush and they jump on you and start, to, it's called an ambushment. They hid uh, beyond your knowledge and they had a surprise attack on you. But that in the revelation, Listen, the Bible says the Lord set an ambushment uh -huh, against, against the children of, Mo, of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir. Uh -huh. And what happened? 
which will come against Judah. So just these nations who came against Judah, God sent an ambushment, listen though, and they were smitten or they were killed. Okay, let's back up because the next scripture is going to be even juicier. An ambushment requires people, human beings who are hidden somewhere and they are supposed to jump on these three nations and beat them down. But the Bible just said that, and God said an ambushment. So who was this? Um, who who were these? Who was who were these beings that consist of the ambushment? Watch this now. I love it. Read to understand. Listen to verse uh, uh, twenty. Uh, twenty. Where is it? Twenty-three. Now remember. As they praise, because he tell them, you don't got to fight. Just take a seat in the in the arena, and you all start, you all bond over there, okay? I, I got it from here. This God keeps speaking to them. And the Bible says God sent an ambushment. But who were these people? Who, who was these the entities? Verse 23. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy one another. So let me, let me lay it out for you now. Total spiritual warfare. Joseph and his crew followed the rules, the rules of engagement. So once I follow the rules of engagement, according to these stories so far, God take it from there. God just need me to do my part and he's going to take it from there, right? So, the Bible is saying now, Ammon, that's one nation. The Amorites, uh, the, yeah, the Amorites, another nation. Mount Seir, that's another nation, and some more. So all of them are one accord. They're coming, they're coming, they're coming, running, 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 running. All on one accord with one mind, be coming to shut Judah down, to slaughter every one of them. And God, looking from an aerial vote, watching them coming. God just look at the angels. Or even, remember remember the Bible says, he is He is the God. I love it, I love it, I love it. Let's, let's go back there because I remember one time when I, in fact, when I used to teach this, I used to say that the ambushment would have been the angels who made them turn on one another, right? But I changed my view on that when I read the passage that I told you to look at earlier. When Jehoshaphat says that, are you not the God of heaven? And you're also... Uh, you also rule over all the kingdoms of the heathen. So God says, I'm in charge even of the satanic kingdom. I run stuff there. So here it is, these evil forces that these nations who served other gods had called up because they now come in with confidence because they're in power with evil spirits to shut Israel down. But God says, I sent an ambushment and I believe, just like how Jehoshaphat said, the same God who ruled, that's what the Bible says, rule over the kingdom of the heathen. God gave us decree and says, you know what? You foul spirits, I want you to influence the children of Ammon, influence the children of Mount Seir, and influence the Ammonites. And when they did that, according to the Bible, they turned on one another for no reason and began to stab and, 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 and take on each other. And they slaughtered each other. Israel stood up in the mountains, throwing a party. They got nothing to do with this. They didn't do their part. They followed the spiritual rules of engagement. So God said, okay, you could sit down now. You could go finish party over there. I got this. God, who is the sovereign God, who is the, the, the creator of all creation, and according to Jehoshaphat, who also rules over the kingdoms of the heathen. He said, he said an ambushment. And he made their enemies turn on one another. That's what I read. What you read. That's what I read. Y'all ain't doing cartwheels yet? Y'all ain't doing cartwheels yet? Y'all ain't doing the three and a half quarter twists? Huh? Y'all ain't doing the belly roll? Y'all ain't listening to this thing. You hear what just happened? Did you hear what just happened? And that's how you need to be. Stop putting your confidence in seed. Stop putting your confidence in oils. Stop putting your confidence in scarves and, and, and gloves and foolishness. Put your confidence in God. There's a time for some of those things. Put your confidence in God. 
Father, if you did it for Jehoshaphat, you'll do it for me. If you did it for Elijah, you will do it for me. If Jesus set record that, hey, look here, this kind come by prayer and fasting and so on, then I could do it too. Jesus says, behold, I've given you power. I got that power. But how do I harness it? By following the protocols or the rules of engagement. That's how it happens. That's how it happens. Stop listening to these liars. You're going to be 50 years old, 60 years old, and you still tied to doing the same foolishness that don't work for you. Follow the laws of God. That's what worked for you. That's what worked for you. So let's finish this juicy story. I love it. So the Bible said they destroy one another in verse 23. Listen. And when Judah, verse 24 of 2 Chronicles 20, and when Judah came towards the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked unto the multitude, and behold, they were dead bodies falling on the earth, and none escaped. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came, excuse me, to take away the spoils, huh? Give me this Rolex watch. You don't need this no more. Huh? Give, give me this Fendi bag, huh? And this what the next one name? Gucci, Cabana, whatever. You, you don't need this no more. You're dead. You can't use this. Give me this. You're no good self, huh? Give me this. And let me have these Gucci shoes. Take these slippers off. You don't need these. <laughs> I love it. And I love it. Listen, verse 25. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of the of them, they found among them in abundance, listen, both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewelry. Come on, come. Take if you don't take this, come. Give me this. What is this? 18 carat? You don't need this no more. I'll, I'll, this can look good on the wife. Here, come put this. Let me let me wash this off from these dead people. Now you can put it on now. The Bible says, not Kevin, <laughs> the Bible says, verse 25, And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels, which they strip. You don't need this no more. huh? You don't need this. Which they strip off for themselves. Listen, listen. More than they could carry away. What is this? You sure y'all came here to fight us or you came to bring us some nice precious jewels? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Listen, more than they can carry away. And they were three days. It took them three days in gathering of the spoil for it was so much. Mighty God, Lord of mercy. All you this? They had no idea. Now, what had me, right? I don't know who has come to fight people with jewelry and diamonds and precious whatever. But here's what I believe. See, they came to take over the land. They came to wipe out Judah and literally uh, dispossess Judah of the land and they were going to take over. So what they did is they brought everything with them, all their precious jewelry. Now, And I and I know there was God behind that too. God says, you're going to fight them right now. Don't, now get that Rolex. Get that Rolex. And that, make sure the presidential one with the real diamonds, all right? Okay, because I think that looked good on Joseph at <laughs> Joseph address. Okay. You need that. And make sure you get the Gucci and Prada slippers. Make sure you got that. Make sure you carry everything. Don't leave nothing here in your particular countries because I can need my people wearing the best. All right. Now you all come fight them now. So God is watching all of this. So God was the ruler of all things. And then according to the scripture, it says that He uh He ruled over all of the kingdoms of the heathen. That's why I read it twice, three times for you. So God says, okay, I had enough now. Now you demons who they hired to come do their bidding, now I need you to influence them to fight one another. So for about a few hours, all of the nations went crazy and killed one another. Now if that ain't God, then you tell me what God is. I love it, I love it. So I'm going to close with this. I'm going to give you a list, and this, 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 of course, this is not exhausted. It's a short list, and it's a list of some of the rules of engagement. And the purpose of my teaching tonight is to drill into your understanding, like I always do. Stop buying into the seed sowing. Stop buying into the uh, sowing seed for a husband and a, the, the God. It does that. Those they are not the rules of engagement. All right. So let's go to the first rule. All right. The first rule, let's go to 2 Corinthians, and I want you to write this down, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 
verses 3 to 4. 2 Corinthians, these are all rules of engagement now. I gave you those stories, and you're going to see these rules and those stories. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're going to read from verse 3 to 4. Now, what does it say? For though these are rules of engagement, these are principles in the spiritual world, for though we walk in the flesh, we walk about as human beings, uh huh. we do not, we do not war after the flesh. It's a spiritual rule. is a rule of engagement. Don't you ever, don't you ever see your physical enemy as your true enemy. There's a force behind that enemy influencing that person. So Paul here telling the church of Corinth, write it down. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 4. For though we walk in the flesh, who's this we? We the believers of Jesus Christ. We do not war after the flesh. Listen to verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare, the weapons that we use are not carnal. That word, that word also means they're not material. So in this spiritual war, he's saying you cannot get a gun. You cannot get a whip, you cannot get a knife, and you cannot get a mace spray and spray it in a demon face. I see some preachers, you know, online and so on, on Warfare Sunday, they dress in camouflage and these little toy guns and doing foolishness. And I say, while I kind of get what they're trying to say, let's just stick with the scriptures, all right? I, I, I get your visual, but I think people would be more uh, persuaded if we're hearing from the word of God, okay? So listen to this. So he says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strong. In other words, if I'm using the word of God, it will pull down those strong forces in my life that's coming against me, just like Jehoshaphat. They realize that physically we cannot defeat these nations against us, but through God, prayer and fasting, through that, listen, all we need to do is, is to, Engage the rules because now I'm gonna we're gonna wake up our spiritual helpers to help us. Okay, that's rule number one. Rule number two, you I know you all know this, right? He just told you we are not wrestling against uh flesh and blood. So let's go to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter six. Uh I'm gonna look at verse 12. And what does it say? For we, who's this we again? We need to be clear because it's for a specific set of people. Those who believe in Jesus Christ. So this is why I'm telling you, if you have accepted Jesus Christ, and if you had not had a course in spiritual warfare, then you will suffer more defeats than victory. Because you don't know who you're fighting. You don't know how to fight them. You don't know how to engage. You don't know the rules of engagement. After accepting Jesus Christ, you need to know what you signed on to. You are now a soldier in the army of the Lord. But this, so, this, this army... And your fighting have nothing to do with the physical realm. In fact, the physical realm will always be the evidence of what you should or should not have done in the spiritual world. All right? So Ephesians 6 and 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So he's now going to tell the church of Ephesus, this is Paul, who and what they're really fighting. All right? Because Paul even see here that the church needed a crash course in spiritual warfare. They needed an understanding. Screaming in tongues and jumping around and all the foolishness, that ain't going to help you. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual, invisible wickedness in high places. So that hierarchy there is telling us that the fight we're fighting is invisible. However, how we perform in that fight will now dictate the course of our physical lives. In so much words, in layman terms, if I fail spiritually, then by default, I will be failing in my physical life. If I am winning spiritually, by default, I'll be winning physically in my life. In other words, my spiritual life, write this down, is always and consistently dictating the course of my physical life. I try to help you. I trying to help you. You may not be able to see the angels. You may not be able to see the demons. You may not be able to see all of this other stuff. I don't need to see it. Just give me the rules. Let me just blindly do the rules. That's all. I don't need to know all the details, you know. Give me the rules and let me 
do what the rules say. Why? Because in every rule, every law, every precept, every command is a term, a predetermined end result. If I follow it in the protocol or order, I ought to follow it in. Nowhere in scripture, if I pour the oil on me, I will be victorious in the spiritual realm. Nowhere in the scripture, if I speak in tongues over and over, that I will beat up all the demons. Nowhere is giving, I'm giving you the rules of engagement. Watch this. Now, so far it says, the first one it says that, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, right? Sorry, that's the second one. Uh, the other one was our second Corinthians 10 verse 34. Again, reiterating where our real fight is. Now, listen to this one now. Same Ephesians chapter 6, but we can read verse 10 and verse 11. Listen, Paul is now saying to the church of Ephesus, he says, finally, my brethren, this is the last piece of information I can leave you with. He says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Watch what he says now. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, this is powerful spiritual warfare information. Why? Because just like a lot of you, when I first entered into Christianity, they said to me, I, I always say this to you, they said, Kevin, listen to me carefully. Once you have Jesus, everything is going to be all right. The devil can't touch you because you got Jesus. And I believe them. Remember, I'm a novice at this. I know nothing. I had no spiritual warfare classes. As far as I'm concerned, I have accepted Jesus, and I must believe that, and I did that. All right? However, hell was breaking loose on every end of my life. Temptations came like crazy, and I admit this all the time. I'm very, very open about it because I want you to see I'm a genuine, real person, and you need to get real if you want to be successful in this walk. I fornicated more as a Christian than I did as a sinner. Let that sink a little bit. I'm being real with you. I always real with you. I fornicated more as a Christian than as a sinner. But why? How come, how come you didn't overcome that lust and all that other stuff? Who was teaching me to overcome it? Because I was told if I had Jesus. And I was confused too because I'm crying and weeping and praying. Father God, why don't you take this lustful spirit from me? Why can't I just turn away from it? I would fornicate and I would be guilty and I would go and pray only to do it the next day. I'm trying to help you. You see, because in my mind, it was the poison. If I stay away from this poison, I wouldn't fornicate no more foolishness. Nonsense. There was a spirit that I had on me that no one could tell me. No one say pray against the spirit of lust. In fact, I couldn't tell them that because I was told by that particular church, if you're still in sin, you're not, you're not, you didn't really get saved. See the kind of nonsense I got to put up with? So my initial years in Christianity was a, a, it's a ball of confusion because I was told I got Jesus and all this other stuff, but yet I still fighting with sexual immorality. Still fighting, still fighting, still lusting, still looking at every little thing and a little mini skirt and tight chest and all this other stuff. This, 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 this uh, Christian man, Kevin over here, nobody know what I'm dealing with on the inside. I'm trying to help you all. Don't judge me. I'm trying to help you. Some of you all got the same problem. Until I encountered the rules. I encountered the rules. The church that I went to, they were more about condemning you. Some of you in here, you're still fornicating and showing up in church. Oh, showing up in church. Glory be to God. Oh, you better get it right with God. How? How do I get it right with God? I, I followed what you said. I did what you said. I came to the altar. You told me to cry out to God. I cried out to God. The Bible says through knowledge. Shall the just be delivered? Not crying out to God, not pleading out to Jesus. Jesus say, read my word, get my knowledge, now apply it. And watch how these things can break off of your life. The sweetest day of my life was when I was free from that evil, foul spirit. Because it had me locked right down. But, I, but guess what? You all ready for this part? I was a co-conspirator. I assisted the spirit through my ignorance. Had I known what I, what I learned from the get-go, that spirit would not have no hold on my life. None. None. I literally used to cry because I was I, I was so defeated. Listen to me carefully. You, know, you all know me. I don't play. Fornicate with this woman. Remember, I'm a Christian. Okay, this this, this back in the 90, late 1990s, right? Fornicate with her. 
Lord, forgive me, Jesus. Father God, I feel so sorry. And I literally cried. I really mean it. The next day she called me, I will see you again. No, I can't do that. I I I trying to live right. I I I see you can't fight off. That's why he said you are not wrestling against flesh and blood. He says the, the weapons of our warfare, you telling them no, or you uh whatever, you don't still don't get it. There was a spirit with the army of the Syrians that came against Elijah. There were spirits with the armies of Ammon, Moab, and so on that came against Judah and uh, Jehoshaphat. Had they told you that there's a spirit and we're going to come together and help you beat the spirit down, you would be much further than you are right now. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. You could judge me, but I'm trying to help you. So listen to this. So he says, finally, this is the next rule. This is rule number one, two, three, number three. Rule number three. Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 11, he says, watch this now. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole arm of God. Now, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. See, again, we need clarity. We need understanding. We don't need to debate. Who is the apostle Paul talking to? Because we need context now for it to make sense. Because when you hear him say, put on the whole arm of God, well, he can't be talking to Christians because these Christians are already saved. They already know God. If I already have Jesus, because now you begin to see the cracks in what they told me. They said, if you have Jesus, Kevin, you don't have to worry about nobody. No devil could touch you. But that ain't what I just read there. Because the church of Ephesus were people who accepted Jesus Christ. But Paul is now telling them, even though you have Jesus Christ, rules of engagement again, you still got to put on the whole armor. But they didn't tell me that. So thank God, now I begin to understand grace. Grace kept me. Grace, you think if I was back in the days of the Old Testament, I was messing around like that, I would have been a dead man. Thank God for grace that even in my ignorance, God grace kept Kevin. I'm trying to help you all. God grace kept me because I, this thing had a hole on my life. God grace kept me. Even though they wasn't teaching me yet, God grace kept me. So he says, put on the whole arm of God, listen, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Who is he talking to? He's talking to the believers of Christ. And these people already have Jesus that some of the churches are telling them, once you got Jesus, you don't got to worry about nothing because God ain't going to let it happen to you. The Bible is telling me, that's why I read my Bible, that if you don't have on this armor, you who got Jesus will not be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That's what I read. What did you read? What did you read? One day you can get tired of these churches. One day you can get tired of playing games. One day you can get tired of wasting your life and this stupid stuff and come right back to the word of God. And now let's really see what the word says. They told me, Kevin, you don't ever, listen to me. No voodoo could touch you. I don't care what, you know who you are? You see, you don't know whose you are. You are of God. Great is he that is in you. And no weapon form against you shall prosper, Mr. Ewing. Yeah, but you won't give me that in context, though. Because the rules of engagement <coughs> tell me that even as a believer, I must armor myself. You, you made no mention of that. Let's go to the next rule. All right? Let's go to James chapter 4, verse 7. We're looking at rules. They hate rules. Let's look at James chapter 4 and verse 7. Let's see what the rules say. The rules now is giving us a protocol. Submit, listen, submit yourselves before, therefore to God, all right? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, let me see if I get this right. They said, I don't have to worry because God got me, right? And the devil can't touch me, okay? I just read, in spiritual warfare rules, that the first thing I need to do, remember he's talking to the believer. He said, now, on this journey, and if you want to be victorious, protocol is key. Not only is protocol key, the law of first mention is of a necessity. So what does that mean? The law of first mention is exactly how it's protocoled or laid out in scripture 
It's exactly how I must follow it. So the Bible says, okay, now you realize you're in a warfare, invisible one, right? Spiritual warfare, Kevin. Now you have to submit myself, to, submit yourself to me, God. And what that means is you must follow my rules. You got to read it and study it for yourself. Don't listen to these people. And now you do exactly that submitting to me. Now he says, now when you do that, when you do that, now, when you resist the devil, he would flee. Oh, okay, now it makes sense. Because when I was so tied up in fornication as a Christian, I really wasn't really submitting myself to you, God, to be quite honest with you. And so when I was praying for the devil to leave me, I see why he never left. Because the protocol says I must submit myself to you. That's the first rule. Now, when I resist him, he will honor and leave from my presence. But he said, I ain't going nowhere because you never submitted yourself to your God. You believe when they told you that because you got Jesus, I can't touch you. Yeah, that makes sense. Wow. That's why you need to know the rules. That's why you're defeated. That's why you can't get ahead because you're doing their rules, but you're not doing the rules in which Jesus laid out in scripture. Let's look at another one. Let's go to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5. I love rules. I love rules. 1 Peter chapter 5. And let's look at verse 8. 1 Peter 5 verse 8. I'm about to be given some more rules, spiritual warfare, because that's what I signed on to when I decide to become a Christian. Be sober. Who is he talking to? The believers of Jesus Christ. Be sober or be alert. Be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, and he's going to say who he is, the devil. Now, this is important now. This is important because the scripture is about to show us, again, Satan, number one tool, whenever he comes after us. It is to always uh, embellish himself. The word embellish means to make himself bigger than who he really is. And all of that is to, to promote fear in us. So he says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, he isn't a roaring lion, he's pretending to be rawr, rawr, to induce fear. As a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. So if the scripture is saying the behavior of the devil, which is to uh, highlight something he is not, to be this one to be feared, he says, he's doing this and walking about, seeking whom he may... So who's the ones that he's going to devour? The ones like Kevin, who is just going on the premises. Once you got Jesus, you are all right. You don't need no spiritual armor. You don't need to submit yourself to God. You don't need to know the, 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 the protocol of we wrestle not against flesh. Forget that. Because here in this church, we believe that once you got Jesus, ain't no devil could harm you. You see why you need to know the rules? You see why you need to know the rules? So the devil came, bully coming. He said, hold on, hold on, hold on. Lust, come here. Kevin over here trying to get stuff right with God. Get him. He haven't submitted to God. Get him. He didn't put on no armor of God. Get him. So when the spirit of lust, that was generation in my family, when that came on me, I had to submit to lust. And like a slave going right back, to the thing, I just finished crying to God about the night before, repenting. Here I am back in the ark again. Why? Because of erroneous teaching. Nobody ever taught me about spiritual warfare. Nobody said, now that you are a child of God, now that you are Christian, and now that you understand that you've accepted Jesus, you are part of the army of God, but this is a, a, a spiritual army. Now let's take you into spiritual warfare classes so that you will be fully aware of what you now really up against. No. So again, this is where the grace of God, and I thank him daily for his grace. So this is why I don't condemn people. This is why I don't jump on them and tell them, like start a party who's be calling women whores and stuff. I don't do that. Because even though they're condemning them, they're still not teaching them spiritual warfare. They are preaching and arguing to be right because they're conceited and full of themselves. They're not about educating and empowering you so that you could go off on your own and do your ministry and empower other people. No, keep under our umbrella. And if you leave here, you're going to be cursed. But until then, you stay here totally ignorant of the rules. You would be praying for the devil for every time. The devil is a liar. 
Let's look at another rule. Let's go to 1 John, 1 John 4, verse 4. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4. Listen, listen. He's about to tell us a rule now. Ye are of God, okay, little children, and have overcome them. Mm -hmm. Because greater is he that is in you, excuse me, than he that is in the world. So the Bible here, you must understand the scripture. The Bible is telling us that clearly there's a greater spiritual power that resides in us than Satan, who is the God of this world, right? But you still will say, well, Kevin, ain't that what you just say? Because if God is great inside of you, then how come Satan's still overtaking you? Read the whole scripture. In order to get context, you need pretext, you need post-text, and that will give you context. So let's go over the scripture again because we will make sense. We want to get an understanding. We want to, don't want to debate. Verse 4, you are of God. He's talking to the believer, right? But now listen how he labeled you. Ye are of God, what? Little children. Why would he call us little children? Because children must do what? Obey. The job of a child is to obey their parents, obey their guardians, obey their leaders. So the scripture now, spiritual protocol, he says, listen, you are of God. And yes, great is he in you than he that is in the world. But that is of no power or use to you to overcome what is in the world if you don't submit yourself like children unto the master who I am trying to help you tonight. See, nobody told me this. You read the scriptures. And even though you read it, they're telling you something else. No, 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 no. Listen carefully. Ye are of God. You, are, you belong to God, you Christians. Let's be clear. But let's also be clear. You are his children. And what do children do? They obey. So we say, if you follow that, then listen to this now. He says, and not only if you, if as little children, if you obey, you will overcome them. Why? Then he said, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So it's telling me that if I obey God, the spirit that is in me, according to the Bible, that raised Christ from the dead, that same spirit will allow me to overcome whatever come against me. But I have to be working in tandem or in concert with God, who I am a child of. It cannot happen by me giving a seed. It cannot happen by me just speaking in tongues. There are rules. So while to the novice, I'm like, I want to be just like them. I want to speak in tongues just like them. You don't want to do that. That shouldn't be your priority. Your priority should be, give me the rules. If I could get the rules, because speaking in tongues don't give you power. Give me the rules. Watch this now. Watch this. Let's look at another rule. James chapter 1, verse 13. James chapter 1, and, and there are thousands of rules. I'm just bringing these here because this correlates with what we talked about tonight. James chapter 1, verse 13. What does it say? Let no man say when he is tempted. Uh-huh. These are rules. I am tempted of God. Why? For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempt he any man. This is a rule. This is a rule. Because I, at some point, said to myself, I know this can sound crazy, uh, when I was kind of doing a little bit in my fornication department, see, I, I own my sin, y'all don't. But anyway, and again, this was years ago. And at times, when I am tempted, I literally said, it's probably God testing me. No, that isn't what spiritual rules of engagement protocols say. I just read here. Now, I don't know who tell you that. Because I know some preachers would tell you that. Sometimes God will put you through a test. <laughs> and God will bring the woman there and tempt you. <laughs> to see if you really love him. <laughs> really? Well, let me see what I read here. Let no man say when he is tempted. I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempt he any man. So is God or the preacher a liar? 
Let's make it make sense. Let's look at another rule. Let's look at another rule. I gave you this one here earlier, right? I can give it to you again. All right? Just to reinforce my point. So let's go <laughs> to 2 Kings 6, 2 Kings 6, 16. I gave you this already. You should have this done already. Again, rules. And he answered Elijah and said to his servant, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. So what is this rule saying? This rule is only bringing home my point that I've been reiterating all night. This is why Paul said to the church of Ephesus, uh, specifically Ephesians 6 and 12, for we the believer wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? Then he gave the hierarchy of the evil forces that we wrestle against. And the in Corinth, the church of Corinth, 2 Corinthians 4 and 18, it says, uh, set not your eyes on the things that are seen, for the things that are seen are temporal. Set your eyes on the unseen. He's talking about the spiritual world now. So Paul is reiterating throughout his ministry. Listen, I try to get the saints to understand the real fight, the real problems, be it cancer, uh, murder, whatever it is, good or bad times. If you want to be successful, then focus on the unseen world. So here in 2 Kings 6 verse 16, Elijah is saying, now, son, I, I know where you are. I used to be like you. Just like Kevin is telling you right now, those who are dealing with fornications and stuff like that, sexual immorality, I know where you are. So I, I could never come from come at you from a condemnation perspective. I come into you from a wisdom perspective. How to apply the wisdom. The wisdom is simply uh, articulating the knowledge you're receiving right now. So Elijah says, son, listen, I know how it look. And I, I'm not going to condemn you because... You only could go as far as where your fate is at. But I can ask God to help you speed up the process a little bit. So Elijah said, Lord, I pray right now that you would open up. So do me this one favor, Lord, because he will never be convinced as to why I'm so calm right now. So Lord, open his eyes, his spiritual eyes, so that he could really see. And now the boy's eye, the boy eyes are open. Now he see some spiritual stuff that was always there. But now he's being made privy to it through his spiritual lens. I'm trying to help you. Okay? Watch this. Psalms 91, because we can build on this now. Psalms 91. These are all rules. Psalms 91, verses 11 to 12. So we're going to see some stuff God did for us, those who believe. He says, for he, who is he? God, shall, not might, shall give his who? angels. That sounds like plural to me, more than one, yes. He shall give us angels what? Charge or what? Command. I should give them command over thee to keep thee or to guard thee in some of thy ways. No, no, that's not what the rules say. He says, there are angels right now whom God has given command. I'm putting you in command over Kevin. Now You are responsible for taking care of Kevin. If given us angels charge over us to keep us in all of our ways. And it goes on to say in verse 12, he says, they shall bear thee up. Who's this day? These angels. In their arms, least thou dash thy foot against the stone. So let me explain that to you. Because you've never seen no arm of no angel, right? No. But how does it happen? So one day you're walking and there was a step that you couldn't see. And so you continue to walk as if you're on the same flat pavement, but there's really a step. And when you went to put your foot flat on the ground, because it was a step, your foot, you miss your step and you're about to fall. But you were caught up and someone passed and say, wow, you lucky, eh? You almost fell. Yeah, that's true. No, 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 no. That isn't what I read. What I read, you who've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, God, has assigned some angels to you. And he said, from what I'm reading here, he says, they, which are the angels, shall bear thee in their arms if you as much, let me read this here, as dash thy foot against a stone. The, the angels save you. I don't know if I told you guys this before. I believe I did. In 1991, August 23rd, still working at FedEx as a courier, 
and I was about to make my last uh, package delivery, right? And I was in a small little Suzuki van. So I'm going through the, red, the my light. My light was on green, just turned on green. So I'm going through the light, and there was a lady through my right peripheral who was literally hurling, speeding towards my vehicle. Well, later on I learned that she didn't have any brakes. She lost her brakes. So she's trying to hurry speed across because she couldn't stop. And she hit the back of my vehicle. And it was a small Suzuki van. The actual engine was underneath my seat. That's how small it was. And the vehicle spun and it threw me out of the vehicle about 60 to 70 feet in the bush. What was so amazing was where I landed about a week or so, they had just cleaned up that area. And a lot of the trees that they, they chopped, so there were some trees that were still sticking up from where they chopped them. But for whatever reason, when I landed, the van flipped, land on me, and both of us went, I could see the trees and bushes flying past me. At this point, I'm saying, Lord, don't let me die. From the time it hit, like everything just went in slow motion. And literally, I'm not lying to you, you know, there's a saying that, you know, when you're near death, your whole life flash in front of you. I literally experienced that, literally. I literally, within a split second, and the fear was overwhelming. So while this vehicle was spinning, I didn't even know when I was thrown out of the vehicle. But the only thing I kept saying, I wasn't a Christian then. This was 1991. I didn't get saved until 1996. I said, Lord, don't let me die. Lord, don't let me die. Lord, don't let me die. At the time, things going on. When everything came to a stop, every time I exhale, because of the weight of the vehicle, well, first of all, I should have been crushed to death. Because of the weight of the vehicle, every time I exhale, it will squeeze me more and more. To the point I began to, to pee myself up uncontrollably because everything is being squeezed out of me. So there was a group of guys who worked for the power company was coming in the opposite direction to me. And I'm being told this. They came out and they all pushed the vehicle on them from off of me. And of course, I shoot from underneath that vehicle as if someone was trying to kill me. Anyway, when it was all said and done, I look at where I was and where all of those sharp uh, tree trunks was coming up. The, where I was, it was like, it was cut out specifically for me. If I had gone an inch to the left, right, up or down, it would have pierced me in my head, my side, whatever. I was on my side. So when I came out, the gentleman who pushed it off, because I knew him very well, it was him and two other guys. And they said to me, they said, when we were coming down, we saw when the lady hit you. I want you to hear the story carefully. Got to do with these angels. When the lady hit you, they said, we watch when the vehicle quickly spun, but in me, it was, to me, it was going in slow motion. And we saw when you were thrown from the vehicle, Kevin, because they know me. And it was like somebody was holding you in the air and gliding you through the air and rest you on the ground. This was the account of three people who was in the truck, the utility truck, coming in the opposite direction because they quickly pull on the road and rush and throw the truck off, the, the Jeep off, the little buggy off of me. So you hear what he said? So again, let's go back here. I have given my angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Now remember though, this is the important part. I wasn't saved then. I was in a Christian then. But what do I always tell you? That's why you don't judge people. <sighs> Even though you're not saved at that time, and I can clear this up for you in a little bit, God is on a consistent basis protecting his investment. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows what Kevin would become. He knows the lives that Kevin, true Kevin, would be saved, delivered, and set free from bondage. He knows this. So while everybody looking around and thinking, my God, this boy lucky, or why would God spare his life and he doing whatever he want to do? Because you you only could see right, right there. God knows the end from the beginning. Now, with that said, let me add some more to this spiritually. So let's go quickly here now to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, beginning at verse 13, all right? Now, remember, I wasn't saved. I wasn't saved, but God protected me. I tell you, man, grace, the way these preachers preach about grace today is, is, is far from what it really is, all right? 
grace is a serious thing here. It is not a, a ticket or a license to sin. It's far from that. Grace is all about God knowing the end from the beginning, and he's preserving his investment. We'll be talking about another day. So Hebrews chapter 1, because remember what I just told you. I am convinced what they saw, me moving through the air like that, that was the angels of the Lord keeping me. So in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 13 to 14, the scripture says, but to which of the angels, okay, said he, which is God, at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So he's asking the questions, to which of the enemies is he saying this to? This is a question, verse 14. He said, instead, listen, are they, who's this day? The angels that he just spoke about. Are they not all ministering? This is key because the word minister means to serve. Ministering means they're serving. <coughs> Excuse me. Are they not all ministering? Listen, talking about the angels, spirits. Uh-huh. Sent forth, they're sent forth, meaning from heaven, to minister or to serve. Listen to this though, this is key. For them who who shall be, who shall be heirs to salvation. Remember, I told you I wasn't saved then. I didn't know God then. I wasn't even trying to know him then. I was in the midst of my evil then, right? This back in 1991, uh, August 23rd. This had to have been like about 11:30 in the morning, between 11:30 and 12 o'clock. And that was the day that the enemy had already planned to drag me to the pits of hell. That was the day I was supposed to go to hell, all right? The, and everything, like I say, while it went in slow motion to me, based on the account of these other people, everything was just going quickly. And when the enemy thought he had me, because I told you, while I wasn't saved, I, I grew up in a Christian home, I know. So I said, Lord... Don't let me die. Don't let me die. I was repeating this over and over and over. I quickly watched my life flash ahead of me. Now, I didn't think I was going to die because I was going to fight to the very end. But anyway, when, and that's what it was. It was an angel that took me out of that vehicle. And when I was tossed into the air, those angels carried me. Now, Kevin, how you could call them the angel and you wasn't saved yet? Let's read the scripture. Verse 14 of Hebrews 1. And they, which are the angels... Are they not all serving spirits sent forth to serve them who shall be, who shall be, not yet, who shall be, I wasn't saved yet, who shall be heir. The word heir means inherit salvation. You listening to me? Even though I wasn't saved, again, thank God we serve a God who knows the end from the beginning. Thank God he already know the course and the path Kevin will take. God says, angels, I need you to preserve that one right there. Him. He ain't no Christian, but he shall be an inheritor of salvation. I love scripture. I love it. I love it. I, listen, I listen, listen. I so love. I could do this all night, all day. I love it. I love it. I love it. I, it is so. I getting chill bumps right now. This is so beautiful. I should have been like those who have done worse than me in hell right now. I wasn't saved, and I didn't even say, "Lord, save me." Listen to this. I said, "Lord, don't let me die." If my head had hit a rock and instantly killed me, I did not repent. All I was saying from start to finish, Lord, don't let me die. Lord, don't let me die. Lord, don't let me die. All of those sharp things that was around me, God had already carved. When those guys were cutting those trees and, and clearing that particular space, it was at a cross section. They had no idea when they were cutting, the angels of the Lord was guiding them because Kevin can be here next week. So you cut here, you move that, and move this here, because we can put him right here. So be ready for him. When the devil come at him next week, the angels of the Lord are on patrol, waiting to preserve God's investment. This is why I tell you over and over, do not be like these other people, condemning people. Don't do it. Don't do it. The day is going to come, especially for those of you who don't know the Lord as yet. When you're going to find yourself in a hard place and you're going to need this God. And I hear people say all the time, oh God, don't listen to the prayers of sinners. 
he don't listen to the prayers of sinners, so I don't know. Well, that's what you say. He hear my prayer. Why? Because I'm an heir of salvation. I was back then. I was an heir of salvation. Rules, laws, principles. Parents, listen to me. Your daughter out there, if she engaged in a relationship that you know what the end of that is going to be because you've been where she's at, but she's rebellious right now. Don't call her rebellious. Don't cuss her out. Pray. Just how God preserve you until the day of your salvation, there's a day for her also. Pray for her. Don't cuss her out. Pray for her. Don't speak evil of her. Pray that God will protect her from diseases and and bringing babies into the world where these guys would never take care of. Don't, don't talk foolishness. Speak over her life. Speak over her life. She will be saved and sanctified and fulfill the will of God in her life. She will be an obedient child. I don't care how she acting up. Mom, your sons, smoking dope 24-7, have no desire to work. Don't speak what you see because you're enforcing whatever they're doing. Speak life over them. There's a day assigned because one day they will be inheritors of salvation. The angels, the Bible says, God sent forth his ministering spirit to minister or to serve those who shall, not who are, who shall become heirs or inheritors of the free gift of salvation. So that means one day they're going to get it together. I'm trying to help you. Don't listen to these people telling you foolishness. Don't listen to these people telling your daughters who wear and weave as a whore. These people are hurt. They are emotionally damaged. They have plenty of traumas. Plenty of preachers have trauma from the past. Some of them was abused. Some of them were bullied and so on. And so now, rather than being healed, they come on a pulpit and behave as if the grace of God stop at them. Pray for them. Pray for them. Pray that they'll be delivered. They need salvation. All right? So let's go to our last scripture and we finish. Isaiah 54. More rules. Isaiah 54. I love this one. This is so beautiful. Isaiah right here. And uh, 54. Excuse me. Isaiah 54 and verse 17. Listen to this now. These are rules. But as you can see, I'm taking my time. And I'm repeating them, but I'm explaining them because a lot of you would have read them and missed the revelation embedded in them. Or what it says for you as a predetermined end result if you engage them. So Isaiah 54 verse 17 says, No weapon, no weapon form that is formed against thee shall prosper. No weapon. Now listen, because I know some of you, but Kevin, some weapons formed and, and they prosper on me. Again, read to understand. Don't read to debate, okay? No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And, 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 meaning also, and every tongue that shall rise up against thee in judgment, thou shall condemn. Watch. This is the heritage. There goes that word again. Heritage and heir all mean the same. This is something that I inherit as a part of my salvation. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me. So let's go back to the beginning of this last rule. You're a Christian, I'm a Christian. And the scripture just said to us, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. But you and I know that there are weapons that was formed against us, and it did prosper. In fact, some are prospering right now. So it sounds as if the scripture made a little boo-boo or it contradicting or it's an error. No, you would think that if you don't read to understand. Let's read it again. He says, no weapon. But before we read that, let me let me show you another, let me show you another scripture here, right? Because he's going to tell you, he's going to tell you here who these weapons are being formed by. All right? Okay, I can't find it here. But it's in the same passage where he says, though weapons will be formed, but they are not by me, saith the Lord. It's in the same particular chapter, but I can't find it. But if you find it, you could post it. But it's in the same Isaiah 54. So he's telling you these weapons that are formed are not by him. He's not the one forming these weapons against you, right? 
It's in the same chapter, Isaiah 54. All right. All right, I am determined to find this. Ain't nobody posted yet? <laughs> I am determined to find this. Okay, let's start from verse 11. Let's start from verse 11 of Isaiah 54. It says, O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors, and lay thy foundations with sapphire, and I will make thy widows of a gates, and thy gates of carbuncles, and all thy borders of a pleasant stone. And listen, and all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and shall be the peace of thy children, and great shall be the peace of thy children. In righteousness shall thou be established, thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fail, and from terror, for it shall not come upon thee. Behold, they shall gather, they shall surely gather, or oh, does it here? Verse 15, Behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. God said, I am not the one inspiring them to do this. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. So let's just drop quickly to verse 17 again. Now he's saying, no weapon formed against me, but the weapons are, have been formed, but they're actually working against me. So he said, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And, <coughs> so the word and there, it's a very critical word because it's saying that what it's saying after an also relates to what is said before the word an. So he said, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that has risen up against you, you must condemn. So what is he really saying? This is protocol, spiritual engagement. If the weapons that have been formed against you are prospering, well, according to what came after, and you were not condemning them. It takes me right back to the dream teaching I always tell you. If you have these bad dreams, you rebuke. It's the same as condemning them. You challenge it. You divorce yourself from it. You break the covenants of it. Because when I read this, it would be like, okay, well, God, I hear what you say. No weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. But God, I lose my home. That was a weapon for, I lose my car, I lose my job. Those weapons were formed and they actually work. Did you condemn it in its initial stages? I'm trying to help you. You read to understand, not to debate. I don't listen to debating preachers. They will leave you confused. I need to understand because what I want to do is find out the protocols and the rule because I will now test them. I want to engage them. Why? Because now that I understand them, I'm looking for this result. So this is the rule that I follow. And the sad part about it is the people of the occult, they love the demonic rules. They know. You could tell them, listen, go get two eggs, right? And two stones over the graveyard. And at two o'clock in the morning, there's a hole in the graveyard. You go in there and you do the uh, cabbage patch, okay? And you break the two eggs on your head and you walk out of the graveyard backwards and you'll become a millionaire. They will never question, oh, 12 o'clock, not me. Two eggs, they, they will never question it. Only the believers. Only the, the you tell the believer, well, fast for, for two seconds. Two seconds, my God, I can't, uh, I'm hungry. Two seconds? I don't want to eat nothing else easier. You can't fast for me, Kevin. <laughs> You tell the voodoo man, you, you, you won't put a spell on Mary so you could be the boss. Okay? So what you do is you go kill four cockroach, right, at, at 3 o'clock in the morning. And you walk around the cemetery seven times. And now you do a three and a half quarter twist on that grave. The first grave you come and you're doing the three and a half quarter twist. And make sure when you flip, you land on or ten, ten toes. Now when you do that, you do another back flip. Okay, that, that's it. Ain't nothing else to do. The sinner the, the man don't ever question this master. The sinner man don't do none of that. Only the Christian. You tell the Christian that's going to consecration, prayer, and intercession. My, my, my children, who can pick them up from school? Uh, and, it, and then they wonder. <laughs> they wonder why they never get ahead. The Bible said it's not me. It says that this the children of this world, Satan's children, are smarter than the children of light, scripture. 
scripture. So that's it for me, folks. I hope that I gave you enough material tonight for you. And that's why I love to give scriptures. You don't got to believe me. I don't care if you believe me. Believe the scriptures. I don't give you my opinion. It doesn't matter. I give you the scriptures. And if I ever give you my opinion, like I always say, it is lining up with scripture. All right? Heavenly Father, we adore you. We praise you. We thank you. We thank you, Father God, for this 1,600 people who are on tonight. Almost three hours in, but they love your word. Not Kevin, they love scripture. They love your word. They love the idea that, hey, look, this stuff that I'm learning, I can't wait to put it into practice because God is a God that he cannot lie. If he said it, he'll do it. If he spoke it, he'll make it good. Father, your word declares that let every man be a liar, but let you, O God, be true. So I thank you tonight, Father God, that everyone who decides to wholeheartedly engage your laws, your rules, your principles, you gave us this beautiful gift of the scriptures, the Holy Bible. Father, there's a proliferation of people on TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, everyone challenging your word, everyone trying to pick it apart to say, God ain't real. The scriptures ain't real. Man wrote the Bible. Amen. And hallelujahs of the devil. All of that foolishness. Father, I pray for them. The Bible says that a fool says in his heart, there is no God. I pray for them. I pray that the same grace you extended to me in uh, 1991, April, sorry, August 23rd, when the devil had me on his roster to be a, a member of the eternal flames of damnation, your grace, your mercy intervene. Why? Because you, you said, you know, the end from the beginning, you are the Alpha and the Omega. Nothing escapes you. You are omnipresent everywhere, all the time, anytime. You knew what you invested in me. And you believed in me so much that even though the devil had the legal right to snatch me from time into eternity, into eternal torment, you saw a difference. Father, I thank you that you've graced me with the same mercy to be gracious to other people, to look beyond their faults, look beyond their sins, look beyond their habits, look beyond the demon possessions that they're being possessed with and see someone whom you have created. And the same way I seeked mercy back then, they're seeking it also, even though it may not look so. So Father, we all repent right now. We repent for condemning our sisters, brothers, siblings, co-workers or enemies, whomever. This is why you said to bless those that curse us and pray for those that despitefully use and sincere manner things against us. These people may be preachers one day. These people may be responsible for winning millions of souls all over the world one day. But yet we're walking around. God said, suffer not a witch to live. Kill him, kill him, kill him, blah, blah, blah. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you've removed from me an unforgiving heart, a wretched heart, a miserable heart, a frustrating heart, a heart that was full of offense. I thank you, Father God, that you've removed the scales from my eyes and opened up my eyes the same way you did the servant of Elijah by opening up his spiritual eyes and seeing the reality of the spiritual world and to see what we're really up against. It is my prayer that you open ev the eye of everyone on this, uh, on this uh, video right now, those who will see it in the future and that you will remove the spiritual darkness and scales and that they will come into the knowledge of the truth. Your word is very clear. You said, and we shall know the truth and it is the truth that will set us free. Not debates, not objections, not none of that nonsense. So Father, I pray that you will unleash upon your people like you've done for me. But in this case, I pray that you will double it for them, that you will release upon them a spirit of wisdom a spirit of knowledge, a spirit of understanding, a spirit of counsel and might. Father God, I pray that you would give them a spirit of revelation, just like you do me, to Father God, peer beyond the surface of the scriptures and that the spirit of truth and revelation will reveal deeper revelation of the scriptures to them. I pray like you've done for me that you'd remove that spirit of pride and self and believing that the revelations are coming from myself or, 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 or immersing myself in self-aggrandizement. Father, I have asked you and begged you years ago to remove any fiber of conceit or arrogance or self-aggrandizement or self or self-centeredness. Father, remove any form of residue, any residual of that. I pray that you'll continue to amplify my heart of, of humility towards you. 
and to be a servant to your people. Father, I thank you for your goodness and your grace. Let your wisdom, let your knowledge, let your understanding permeate the mind, soul, spirit, and body of your people. Give them an insatiable desire like you've given me and a hunger for your word that no matter what storm they are hurled in, you will continually keep them in the eye of the storm. That while everything is violently carrying on on the outer bands, only you can give them that peace that passes all understanding in the midst of what is seemingly so chaotic, what is seemingly so irreparable. So Father, we bless you. Father, we honor you. Father, we praise you. And we seal these things with your word that says whatsoever things we desire when we pray. We must believe that we have received it and we shall have it in the matchless and in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. So folks, that is it for me. I thank everyone that has made a donation tonight. I really appreciate you. Thank you once again. You have no idea how much you helped me with assisting the poor. Uh, almost the end of the month now. And I will say this. We have never came up short. Everyone that we have made commitments to, there has always been uh, the resources put in place uh, for them. Uh, we have a big project coming up. Of course, school opening soon. And of course, our school that we've adopted, D3 former school, uh, Freeport Primary. So we're going to be doing some big stuff for them. And it's just so good to be in a position to help other people. Oh, how I long for these days years ago. In fact, I couldn't help myself. But when I begin to engage the rules, the laws, and the principles of God, that is when I saw the difference. Okay, so God, you guys have a beautiful night, and God bless you.